We hope to live in harmony with the citizens of the world. guys, commence to sustain an all-out attack. Our knowledge and weapons. Our ionization layer must be maintained until our relocation is effective. Good. Relocation. The way. I don't remember anything else really being. To you. This is Maddie Dumpster Fire right here on the Ghost Hollywood. And for more information on the helicopter crash that occurred on the set of Twilight Zone, we're going to for another segment of the Ghost Come on, come on, it's time for the Ghost of Hollywood. Well hello wall crawlers and welcome to another episode of the Ghost of Hollywood. I'm Poxy Leonard here with Miss Reagan and tonight we're excited to bring you all kinds of interesting conversation as we sit down with author, filmmaker and sound designer Kelly J. Baker. While known as the Angry Filmmaker, Kelly will tell us his story, beginning with his early work on independent short films, along with his sound and editorial work on Will Vinton's timeless claymation classic, The Adventures of Mark Twain. That movie is so scary. Oh, come on, Poxy. You can't handle a little satanic abstraction in your claymation movies. Well, watching that movie as an adult is like probably way worse than it would be as oh, a child. Oh, whatever. Oh, what, pff, what do you mean, whatever? Sure. Engine Joe trying to stab Huck Finn in the elevator. Eh, yeah, it's terrifying. But if you listen to the things being said and understand them well... Well, what? They're way worse. Like, much more terrifying. Uh, yeah, right. Oh, you know what? Screw it. I'm gonna play a clip. How about that? There's a vapor. The only earthly certainty is oblivion. Welcome to the Mysterious Stranger. What's your name? Satan. Uh-oh. What's the matter? Nothing. Only it's sure a sorry name for an angel. Oh, wow. Please, come in. Magician. Come on! The Adventures of Mark Twain, everyone. Wow. That really was fucked up. I told you. It's it's dark, it's dark, but you know, I am excited to talk with Kelly. I'll, I'll, we'll have to ask him a little bit about it. And and plus, this episode has been like a long time in the works, you know. You want to tell the story or you want me to tell the story? You know I want to tell the story. I got to get my airtime. Ratings are going ratings down. Ratings are up. You mean the show ratings are up. Mine are too. Well, in that case, can we get back to work? 1.5 million in the ratings? Damn, Poxy. Uh, I'm still waiting to be discovered. I hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, Kelly has written quite a few books on his angry filmmaking experience, and these have become known as his Angry Filmmaker Survival Guide series. And all that said, this meant that I, I had to read a lot of books for this episode. It's good for you. Well, maybe for you. But I will say, I did learn a few things. Like what? Like, I learned that in film editing, a flatbed is not attached to a tr- That's enough of your story. <sighs> I'm Ms. Reagan here with Poxy Leonard, and you're listening to The Ghost of Hollywood. When we return, Kelly J. Baker will be with us to discuss his work on movies, his days as a Hollywood sound designer, and then setting out to create his own feature films. That's right, wall crawlers, and I'll be there, too. Shut up, Poxy. Oh, why is tonight so difficult? Maybe if you'd stop puffing the Freon out of the air conditioning unit, this wouldn't be so difficult. Can't get enough of the Ghost of Hollywood? Check out our entire first season, now streaming wherever you choose to listen to your podcast. And don't forget to like and subscribe. While you're at it, check out our website at theghostofhollywood.com so that we can keep you up to date on all the latest with the Ghost of Hollywood. Hello, wall crawlers. I'm Poxy Leonard, and you are listening to The Ghost of Hollywood. Joining us tonight is none other than Kelly Baker. Well known as the angry filmmaker, Kelly began developing short films in the 1980s. During the 1990s, Kelly would work as a sound designer on films such as My Own Private Idaho, Goodwill Hunting, and To Die For, before creating his own feature film, Bird Dog. In the aughts, Kelly would follow up with two more feature films, The Gas Cafe and Kicking Bird. He would also author two books about extreme low-budget filmmaking and another book entitled Road Dog, focusing on his time peddling his movies across the United States. Since then, Kelly has authored two more books and worked on various films. All of that said, thank you for joining us on the show tonight, Kelly. It's wonderful to be here. All right, so let's take a step back. You got your bachelor's and master's of fine arts from USC, and then you did some post-grad work at the American Film Institute. What was that initially sparked your interest in filmmaking? 
I think as a kid growing up watching films with my father, uh, my father was a World War II veteran, so he loved westerns and war movies, and I loved hanging out with my dad. Uh, so we would, you know, watch all sorts of movies, and you know, being a growing up in Northwest Portland. Uh, you never thought that you could work in the film business. Yeah. That was just like a million miles away. But when I was in high school, I was pretty much a, uh, I hated being there, I'll put it that way. And, uh, I, you know, I thought it was an absolute waste of time. But we had an instructor there who <clears throat> was in charge of all like the video equipment. And back then, video equipment, the small portable stuff, usually took like, you know, four men and a dog to carry because portable meant, you know, it was only like 500 pounds. Um, but I would I would shoot you know stuff with that with the gear, uh, shoot things like uh, wrestling matches and crap, and I enjoyed it. And in my year off uh, from uh, after high school, I ran into this instructor, and, and basically uh, I had no direction. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and he still tells the story too that walking down the street and I ran into him, and he said I looked like crap, <laughs> uh, probably hungover, but um, or worse, but. I said, you know, I don't know what to do. What do I do? What do I? And we had a long talk. He stood there on the street with me for quite a while. And he said, you were always so good with that stuff. What about, you know, filmmaking? And my first thought was, you can't make a living making movies, not in Portland. Um, you know, and I've continued to prove that that's correct. <laughs> uh, but um, he lit the fire. And so I went down to... U of O for two years because I had to get my grades up uh, and then transferred and like, transferred to USC and I was lucky enough to get into that program. Yeah. And the rest of it has just been, you know, history, I guess. All right. Well, now your early work is focused around short films, primarily made in the Pacific Northwest during the 1980s. What was your focus or intent in developing shorts as You'll Change and Enough with the Salmon? Too many people, especially young filmmakers think that they're brilliant they think that they're geniuses and everybody wants to make a feature everybody shouldn't make a feature one even though i had my education and made a bunch of films in, in film school and i loved it um i never considered myself a director because it had all been you know uh really really structured when i was directing films there in school and i felt like i needed to really learn my craft and learn how to become a director yeah and so i thought you know, if you want to be a novelist, write short stories to, to get the. So why not make short films first? See if I had something to say. Could I carry it for an audience? Could I entertain? You know, could I say things uh, and do it on a smaller scale? And so I made seven short films. Mm -hmm. And after the last one, I felt like I'd done everything that I, I, I wanted to with the short films. And so then it's like, okay, let's, you know... Let's try a feature. What the hell? Yeah, so <laughs> you basically believe that before you should start um, a feature film, you should start with short films to get a little bit of a practice. You, it, it, as much as this is an art form and everything else, mm -hmm. it's also a craft. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you're not going to do a huge, if you're a painter, you're not going to say, you know what, I'm going to do the the Mona Lisa or I'm going to do some giant Jackson Pollock right off the bat. <laughs> you know, you're going to draw, you're going to you're going to learn about art, you're going to learn about painting, you're going to learn about all these things. And that's my feeling with filmmaking, with any art, it really is pay your dues, learn how to do it, work for other people, work with other people, go see art, go, you know, watch films. I mean, all of that stuff. And, you know, making a short film is really, really hard. Making a good short film is even harder, and then you've got to kind of start all over again when you're going to make a feature film, because trying to entertain an audience or keep an audience involved for 90 minutes is a bitch. It's, it's really, really hard. And I think too many people don't practice enough. They don't, you know. And so when you get that opportunity to make your first feature... If it doesn't turn out well, you know, good luck trying to get that second one done. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I just really wanted to... You I really wanted, wanted to keep them captured into the movie? Well, I wanted to do the best job that I could do. And so, and, and the short films were an incredible learning ground, training ground for me, because I could see how much I could get shot in a day. If I had to do multiple locations, how many locations can I hit? What size crew do I need? How can I... And so it was really, uh, and I say it's like... Uh, even, even making a short film is like making a, a shooting a feature for a single day. 
you know, because you have to take that same attitude towards it. Uh, and so to me, the, more people should make short films first. Well, right? you, yeah. and, and you, um, you know, y- your short films display a range of like of different, um, you know, practices as well, like for lack of better words. Like, you know, like in Enough with the Salmon, you're, there's a lot of you almost like you could do documentary as say, you know, because of this, there's a scenery. There's a lot of you with the camera. Then there's the one. Um, I've, Give me some of the names. There's the one with after you had the uh, the, the reaction to the shot. Friday that, night. Yeah. And that was very interpersonal. It you know, you even wrote about it, how you just had your friends set it up and you kind of went with it and it was raw. And then there's some where you almost experiment with with some dialogue and with scenarios that are that are almost acted out and performed in certain situations, you know. So you have a pretty good range with that. Was there an approach that you were looking for? Like, was that helping you, even though you were trying to develop and get some practice, was it also helping you kind of sell yourself as far as, like, developing for getting jobs and things of that nature? Were you trying to show that you had some dynamic range with these films? I don't think I thought about that. Um, I had these things to say. Uh, the one about the car, Obscure Objective Desire, was the first one. And yeah, I think a lot of my films come about with people giving me grief. Okay. You know, and so uh, my sister was just on my butt about moving that car, you know, and finally it's just like, okay, I'm going to make a movie about this. With You'll Change, you know, I was 35. We were about to have our first kid, our only kid. um, And all of these people were coming out of the woodwork that I knew saying, you know, well, you're going to have to grow up now. You're going to have to be an adult. You're going to change because having a kid. And it's like, I'm not going to change. I'm still going to be who I am. And so I made that film because all of these people just pissed me off. How did you find the the guys that you did to, to do? The they're, all parts friend, they're all friends. They're all friends. Okay, okay. That, and a couple of them are actors, but a couple of them are like you know real people. Were they like, all dads? Oh yeah. Oh, all right. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. They were all they were all dads. And uh, there's a line at the end uh, where one of the uh, fathers basically talks about you know you're so frazzled, and he runs to the store, uh, and you realize you left the kid at home, you know, mm. by itself. And all that stuff. <laughs> that's the only line. That's the only story in that uh, whole film that's ad libbed. Everything else is written. I asked him, "Do you have anything else you want to say?" And he said, "Yeah, I got one more thing." And he blurts this out, and it was just like, <laughs> "Dude, did you really leave your kid at home with yeah. a baby?" And he just said, "Yeah, I'm not talking about that." <laughs> and then, you know, that was. But um, as much as those films look like they're all off the cuff. They're all scripted, yeah. except for Friday Night, the one that is done raw. Well, that's what you wrote about in the first Angry Filmmaker series. You said that was that was pretty raw emotion. That was like the whole premise of, of recording that. Though, I you had to capture that. Yeah, I had been released from the ER. I think maybe thirty six hours when I made that. So I was still really weak. I was still. I didn't know if I could make the film, and I never intended. It was one of those things where I thought if I can survive long enough to shoot the film, that'll be great. But I don't have to edit it because there was a lot of emotional stuff because I almost died. Um, but I don't have to, you know, shoot it, but I don't have to edit it. And then I sunk it up and I cut it. And I thought, okay, well, I, I edited it, but I don't have to finish it. And then it was just kind of like, okay, okay, well, let's finish it. So I finished it uh, and then uh, screened it to uh, some friends of mine who were just shocked because um, it's, it's – what people don't expect from me that film well that's what you wrote um, that you said like a lot of people like even when you submit into festivals like you got kind of i never bummer reaction it. i never submitted it to film festivals my producer did oh okay okay and she did it without telling me at first oh how'd this go down when you found out um you know i wasn't happy but it had been done uh and so i kind of went okay well you did it uh they're out there if it gets into any film festivals great i'm not going um, I don't think, I think only once, and I made that in 95, only once have I been in the audience when that film has screened. What uh, was that like? Because, I mean, it's, it's awful. pretty personal for you. So. For me, it's horrible. Do you, why, do you, why is it horrible? Is it just because you feel vulnerable in front of the audience watching feel, it? or I feel vulnerable in front of the audience, but it, it takes me back to a place where, you know, I, I almost bought the farm. I yeah. mean, it was that, that serious and that close. Um, and it is, I think it's the rawest and... You know, I hate to say it's the best film I've ever made. It's probably the purest film I've ever made. Uh, and that was part of it was because there was no rehearsals. There was no, came in, I had the lighting set up. I'd set the camera. Uh, I called two friends of mine, a cinematographer and a, a sound person. And I said, I've got this set up. I want to tell this story. Listen to me as I'm talking. Do whatever you want. And so all those camera moves and everything else, that was Peter, my cinematographer, just listening and making those moves however he felt. 
by the time we got through the story, because they had no idea what had happened, um, they were both like shocked and, you know, I mean, it was really kind of a weird, remember they both hugged me afterwards, uh, <laughs> probably because I'm still here, you know, I was still here, yeah. but literally I was still, my hands were still shaking uh, from, from the experience. Uh, like I said, I was in my ex, well, my wife at the time, ex now, um, she had no idea. I just told her I was, I need to go down to the studio to pick something up. She would have been, hor well, she was eventually pissed that I, I went down and made a film. Um, you know, cause I was supposed to be home recovery. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you got in trouble <laughs> making a film? Prob probably. But, and that's not right. the reason we're not together well, anymore. There were a lot of other reasons. I, I would hope it wouldn't have come down to that. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> no, but I, I can remember, and you mentioned, uh, film festivals. Uh, there used to be a Eugene film festival and it was great. One year they showed my film stolen Toyota. All right. And I was there for opening night and everybody loved it. And the party afterwards, everybody's coming up and talking to me about how much they love the movie and on and on. And everybody's, you know, having a grand old time. The next year they contacted me and they said they wanted to show Friday night. And I said, you know, okay. Um, and I went down there for that. Didn't sit in the auditorium while it was playing, but was there at the after party afterwards. And afterwards, all these people kept coming up to me to talk to me and tell me how much they loved my film from the previous year. <laughs> But no one wanted to talk you, about Friday night. Uh, do you think that stolen Toyota? It, I, I feel like it's got a relevance now. Like you could play it on local television. You could do a part two stolen catalytic converter. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, like, Welcome like to Portland. Forty years it? later, nothing's changed. Did it? Yeah, nothing has changed, and that's really the and stolen Toyota is about my truck being stolen and totaled. Um, but uh, that's that's a horrible part. Just nothing has changed. But when I made my uh, documentary on the criminal justice system, and that's even earlier, eighty six, I think eighty seven. Yeah. nothing has changed. Uh, and it's you know these films are you know they're about things that need to be talked about, need to be said, and hopefully you know you make films uh, so that there'll be some kind of change, but maybe not. <laughs> what what sort of response did you get from the the criminal justice work? Um, every, people on the left and right both hated it. Why? Um, because I didn't have a point of view. Uh, okay. I showed what the system was. I followed three cases to the courts, a rape, a robbery, and a homicide, and what really happened. And a couple of my filmmaker friends said, you know, fantastic job. You pissed off both sides. <laughs> um, because I didn't say we need to do this or we need to do that or these people are horrible or these people are. I didn't say any of that. It's like, here it is. This is what you got. And you don't know a lot of the stuff that goes on in that system. Uh, and I think it opened a lot of people's eyes. The film is still being used 30-some 30, 30 years later. Uh, it's still being taught at law schools. They use that film. Uh, and so that makes me feel really, really good. Yeah. Um, but so many people wanted me to take a side, and I said, that's not what this is all about, and that's not what this film is all about. This film is to show. And I show both sides, both the, the, the prosecution and defense, as much as possible The in one of the cases, the defense would not cooperate with me and actually actively subpoenaed me and tried to get me shut down and everything else. And that's not in the film. Really? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had to show up one day to court with my own lawyer to try to be able to keep doing all this stuff. And so it got it got really ugly at one point. You were able to work it out, uh, I suppose, to a certain degree? Uh, you know, I, I was able to continue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I still have a bone to pick with a particular lawyer who lied in front of the judge in court and all this stuff. But apparently lawyers can lie and they don't get into trouble. Uh, if we do, you know, we get into all sorts of trouble. So that was, I've done a bunch of films on the justice system over the years and, uh, I try not to anymore. It just depresses the hell out of me. <laughs> Could imagine and it, and so. it doesn't change. And it, that's, that's the problem. It doesn't change. Well, I read in the Angry Filmmaker books that you screened some of your short films at festivals like we were just talking about, which generated more interest in your work. What were some of your first experiences like and what opportunities came from this? Um, opportunities are you talking about uh, for work or are you talking about... Um well, just in general, you know, like, I mean, yeah. like, say, because, you know, anything when, when you're working in... in um, We'll say in entertainment right, right now, but right, you're kind right. of you're always kind of out there. So there's always creative th or interesting things that come out from it, just general experiences. What right. what happened after these things? You know, you start getting out there, you're throwing these films out, and, and then all of a sudden, people are you're talking about responses already. Right? Yeah. What what when does this start driving you towards you know certain career motivated things? And, and wow, I don't know if I've ever had a career motivated thing. In my, no, I mean I, I have what I want to do. <laughs> all right, I, yeah, know, all right, I'm I mean, following you. Okay, yeah, but um. With uh, Obscure Object of Desire, the one about the car, that was the very first one. Yeah. And I got rejection notices from probably 50 film festivals. 
50. What was, were there any specifications? No. I've never submitted to film festivals, so do, do oh, they just no. tell you just, to fuck off? They're just like, no, we don't want it. You just get the, the, the letter saying, you know, it doesn't fit in, doesn't, you know, whatever. All right. Uh, there was no, there was never, there was rarely ever a person behind it. Um, and then I sent that, I, I saw there was a national PBS series that was looking for short films, uh, and I actually tried to sell them on the criminal justice film, which was too long. They agreed to look at it, but the guy said, do you have anything else? And this is out of Minneapolis. And so I sent him the little short film that had been rejected by 50 film festivals, and he called me back like a week and a half later saying, congratulations, we're taking your short film, not the long one, but the, the short film, and it's going to be the very first film on the first night in, 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 in of our series. Yeah. So it's like, boom, 50 rejections, but I get a national PBS airing, and probably more people saw it that first night than would have seen it at film, 50 film festivals. Yeah. And the interesting part with that then is, then I start getting phone calls from all these film festivals saying, submit that film to us. We want you to submit that. And, you know, and I say with glee that I got to say to a couple of people, you know, I already did and you rejected it. Right. And I was told by, you know, a couple of these film festivals said, well, yeah, but that was before we knew who you were. Uh. And I went, what do you mean know who I was? I am still the same person. I'm still, but because someone else thought now that you I got was legitimate. social capital. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I can remember going down to the PBS station in uh, L.A. I was down there for another reason, and I had made another film. Uh, you'll change at that point. Um, but they had wanted me to come. The programming people wanted me to come down. They wanted to meet me because I was going to be in L.A., and I had all these people in the programming office coming, you know, kind of saying, oh, God, we loved your movie. Oh, the car thing was so, you know. And it was really gratifying after all these rejections that this film, you know, finally found its audience. It was really, it's done really well since then. The other films, um, they all did really well. They've played, you know, all over the world, uh, literally. And uh, I got a phone call from the pro, uh, head of programming at a uh, station, station TV Ontario in Canada, and she'd seen like three of the films at that point and loved them and wanted to buy them all for the series that they were doing, and did I have anything else? And so I absolutely lied through my teeth and said, I've got three more that I'm working on right now. Yeah. And she said, so what are they? And so I made up three ideas off the top of my head on the phone. But you, all right, now before you tell him, because you you write about the elevator pitch. Right. So all right, sit. I want to hear the elevator pitch of these. What oh, do you I got? Don't even, I don't even remember now. I, I mean, it was, no, you got to repitch them now. <laughs> <laughs> what? Dude, it's it's early. I, I'm just I kidding. Had tell coffee. a story. Tell no. a story. No, but um, but so you know, it's like one's on family vacations growing up, and you know, I always wanted to go to L.A. and you know, my parents took me to do L, uh, Northwest stuff. You know, my horror, miserable high school dating career, and then I can't remember what the other one was now. Um. But she said, those sound great. Can you send me the scripts and maybe we can fund them? And, and I had to send everything out to her the next day. I was like, uh, yeah, sure. You know, so I, I stayed up all night writing these scripts really fast yeah. and sending them to her. And I said, can I just send like outlines? Oh, that'd be fine because we know your style. Uh, and, you know, like three or four weeks later, she calls me up saying, you know, we're going to give you X amount of dollars to make each film. Yeah. Uh, but you can't tell anybody. And I said, what, what do you mean I can't tell anybody? And she said, think about it. We're Canadian television, and we're about to pay a bunch of money to an American filmmaker to make films about his life in America. How do you think that's going to go over with my peers? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, mum's the word. Uh, you know, and that was a long time ago. I mean, she's since retired. But she also, she turned me on to Australian television mm -hmm. and some people in Channel 4 and you know, so she helped get my films out uh, all over the world because she believed in them. And I think as an artist, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. You know, I don't want two million followers on social media. You know, I want half a dozen or a dozen that mean it, yeah. that are really excited and want to, you know, can hardly wait to, if I put something new out, they can hardly wait to see it and tell their friends about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, and that's where the whole social media thing I find interesting and it's because, you know, I don't want tons of followers. I just want the right followers, mm -hmm. people who believe. And I think that that's what we all well, want, what don't is, we? Yeah, but, but what is your approach to this? 
I mean, we talk about the approach to low-budget filmmaking, but yeah. what is the approach to having the, the type of followers that you want per, specifically? Say, so, I mean, it's like, you know, film's an open medium, so right. I'm, I think I'm turning the gun on my own head here because all of a sudden I'm like, wait, so you put it out there and then people like it and then you get the followers. You Oh, an epiphany. Anyway. Well, that that's it. I think you put your work out there and people will, ide- hopefully will identify with it. It's, you know, I want to say I really don't care if people like my work or not. Right? Which is true to a point. We all want to be liked. Well, yeah. You know, and we all want. Um, but my feeling is if you don't like my work, I'm good with that. The worst thing you can tell me is you've seen my work and it's just kind of eh. It's kind of, because if it's just eh, then I'm forgettable and my work is forgettable yeah. and that's horrible. Mm-hmm. I would much rather have you hate me <laughs> or love me, right? I mean, it's it's those two things because either way, if you hate me and hate my work, yeah. it means it had, it made an impression on you. And my films, I've had some films that people do not like uh, and I'm good with that. I don't because my work isn't for everybody, and I don't believe in this. You know, what? Who is your audience? Well, it's a general audience. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah. No, it's you have to know, and you have to think about the people who's who are going to like your work or want to see your work. Are you surprised sometimes by the people that have? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Elaborate, yeah, <laughs> elaborate. <laughs> Though your eyes were yes. <laughs> no, um, you know, I, and it goes both ways. Um, with Gas Cafe, the second feature, and in a nutshell, it's about death, sex, and religion, right? Yeah. Um, people either love it or hate it. I've been surprised by some of the people who love it. It's like, really? You you like this one? Uh, and some of the people who just did not like it at all are just kind of, you know, it's like, wow, I did not see that coming. You know, and, and, and I've had a few people, I, I've actually been yelled at at screenings. Oh. oh, we did it. Yeah, we did a screening of Kicking Bird in Chicago. Someone yelled at you there? Oh, oh it was really the upset. Screenings, people always really talk upset. about the crowd doing weird shit at screenings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what and, happened? Well, you know, most of the time when, when we would screen locally, any of us, all my friends, you know, when we have a film screening, a bunch of us would always show up to support each other. And there's that horrible moment when you say, does anybody have any questions? And everybody just sits there. And, th- and you know, and that moment can only last, you know, for like 30 seconds or whatever. But when you're up there, it feels like it's an eternity. Right. And so we would always show up at our friends screenings with a question or two ready. Because once that first question goes... The audience Just a relaxes. Flood of them. Yeah, than everybody else, right? And so, but I'm in Chicago doing this thing, and we we screened Kicking Bird, and the place was packed. There were like 400 people. All right, it, it was a real theater and everything. And I got up there to do questions, and you know, I got no fr- I got one or two friends in the audience, and they were sitting there waiting. You know, they have to. Well, they asked for questions, and I see this nice grandfatherly looking fellow put his hand up. And I went, oh, yeah, this is going to be good. You know, he seemed like such a nice, you know, he's the guy in the cardigan sweater who, you know, goes golfing probably or lives next door to you. You know, I mean, just he was a grandpa, (laughs) you know. So I say, yes, sir, your question. Well, he proceeds to rip me a new butthole. (laughs) What's he do? He, He hated one shot in the film. What what sequence did he hate particularly? Uh, it's uh, where you find out that the teacher is really a slime ball and the student. Oh, when something. when it looks like she's given the blowjob on her right, table. Yeah, right. I didn't know how much we want to give away. No. Nah, uh, anyway, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. All right. But there, it's a lot of implication in that scene. Period. You know, oh, it's, yeah. it's oh, a, yeah. there's some implied. But you know, he just you did not need that. You didn't. I and mean, he's just going on and on and on and on and on, and the whole place goes just quiet. And when you're standing up there and some somebody's grandfather is yelling at you um, and the whole place is just, I mean, you could hear a pin drop and, you know, what do you do? And and so I said, you know what? We tried it without the shot. We, I shot it two ways. You know, we tried it without that and we found that audiences didn't really get it. Uh, and I said, and I made the decision to put that shot in, knowing it might alienate some people. Obviously, it has. Uh, I really appreciate your comments, and you know, thank you for coming. And we can talk about this later afterwards if you would like. Next question, please. You're very professional. I would have thrown something. Oh no, 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 no! You know, the whole thing is yeah. these people have come to see your stuff now. That's true. I don't <laughs> think he hated me. I'm, he wasn't wild about my movie, but you know, but you can't when you're when you're putting your stuff out there, you can't take it personally. 
And if I would have gone off on the guy, oh yeah, well you're full of, cr-, you know, and on and on and on. Next question, please. Is anybody going to ask a question after I've just gone, you know, ballistic? It still took a few minutes and it was one of my friends who had the second question, you know, and so she bailed me out on that. And then the whole audience, but afterwards, all these people were saying to me, so what about that guy? I mean, I mean, you know, that was really, and it's like, what about him? He was just giving his opinion. It's It's all good. You know, I, I don't let stuff like that bother me. I can't. I couldn't imagine it be too bad. You imagine being like Lars von Trier at a Q&A or something, you know? Yeah, see. <laughs> no, and, and I, 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 I have met Lars, and, and that's, yeah, no, I, having a discussion with him is always... Intriguing times, I suppose. Uh, you know, I guess. Not for the faint of heart, anyway. I mean, right. he, you know, he's, he's certainly opinionated well, on just about everything. With a... With <laughs> What's for dinner? What you know? <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating. No, I can't yeah, wait. Like, like, the first time I ask to see Lars von Trier, I'm going to ask him what's for dinner. Yeah. Like, just so he's thrown. I'd no, like, I wouldn't. <laughs> be like, yeah. who the fuck is this guy? No, but, um, so... For, now, now I gotta know though. What happened to the car? Because you're trying in the in the in the short film, you're you're moving it around from your sister. Your sister wants to get rid of it, right. but the car is unique. Like, what kind of car is that? What happens to this thing? It's not like some piece of shit Pinto or something. This is like a fucking cool car, you know? Like, <coughs> it's a 1928 Model A uh, business coupe. For oh, shit. All right, yeah. And it was my father's. Uh, he gave it to me when I was 14, and then I proceeded to take it all apart and didn't know how to put it back together. <laughs> uh, and then Mount St. Helens erupts, and there's ash everywhere, and things, you know, it's a rusting hulk. Uh, but I love that car. Eh. Uh, at the end of the movie, uh, it went to another garage, stayed there for about a year, got thrown out of there, went to a third garage. And after a while, it's just kind of, you know, it's like, I don't have time to work on it. I don't have any money. I don't have to. I need to. So I actually, uh, you know, everybody was saying, uh, you know, just call the wrecking yard. And I said, no, it's worth money. Uh, and I ended up selling it. Uh, I had put an ad in the paper and a whole bunch of people came out and I ended up selling it for a hundred dollars more than I was asking for. It. That's probably that guy who's like been waiting on that part to show up for like 30 years. The guy who I is. sold it to lived in a small town up in the gorge, but he told me, and he was an old dude, neat, neat guy. But he said, mine was a 28, and he had a collection of uh, Fords, and I think he had like 1924 through, I want to say 33 or 34, but he didn't have a 28. And so this was like the missing, and he was going to restore it, and he showed me pictures of the other ones that he'd restored. Mm -hmm. And so it went, as far as I'm concerned, it went to a good home. I gave him a copy of the movie, and I thought, this guy's a freak. I'm sure he thought this guy's a freak. But, you know, (laughs) how many other cars did he have that had a movie about it, you know, before it was even restored? So, but, yeah, so I have no idea. I I can only trust. I hope that he lived long enough to to restore it. It was a neat car. Well... All right, so following <laughs> following your work on short films, all right. Now, at some point, you start going into sound design, right? And eventually, that leads you to working with Gus Van Sant. How does where does all this begin to transition? When do you start working in sound design and start getting into some of these bigger productions? Um, actually, before I started uh, making my own films, I graduated. Uh, moved back up to Oregon because I believed in independent filmmaking. I did not want to stay in L.A. And to me, it's like Hollywood taught me how to do everything in a movie. I mean, SC taught me how to do everything in a film, but then wanted to shove me into an industry that wants me to specialize in one thing. Yeah. And I want to do everything. So I came back up to Portland because, you know, I was born and raised here and uh, ended up getting a job with Will Vinton, the clay animator. Mm-hmm. And he was making his film, The Adventures of Mark Twain, all in claymation feature. And... <sighs> It's a long, it's a convoluted story how I got in to see him, but he hired me for I think three weeks to sync dailies okay. for the film uh, because it was shot live action in studio and then they animated it, everything. And he said, you know, can you sync dailies? It's like, of course I can sync dailies. So he hired me to sync dailies, and at the end of three weeks, he came in and said, I think I've got three more weeks worth of work for you. Uh, you want to do three more weeks? And I said, yeah, sure. Well, this went on for almost six months, every three weeks. He'd come in saying, do you want to work another three weeks? Yeah. And finally, at one point, he just looked at me and he said, do you want to just work here? <laughs> you know, because I've been there all the time. And, and I said, well, sure. Well, you know, why not? Oh, boy, steady employment. And we finished cutting the picture, the reference film, and now we have to wait for the animators to animate everything. Uh, and I thought, oh, shoot, they're going to lay me off. And so I said to, uh, to Will, I said, so who's going to do sound on this? And he said, well, I hadn't really thought about it. Do you want to do it? 
<laughs> so I <laughs> thought very conveniently. Yeah, and I thought, yeah, because I don't want to be unemployed. I don't want to be. Pro- I was already, you but, know. But when you, but when you ask, like, no, I'm t- like, I know now you have a, you're obviously well versed in the game. But where was your experience level with sound design then? Uh, I had done sound uh, on films in school. All right. We'd taken all the classes. So you're not like totally up shit creek here. You're not like, okay, I can do this. And you're like, how do I do this? Uh, I, was, I was a little bit like, you know, uh, and, and I've done this before. It's like, I think I can do this. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, okay, give it a sh-, you know. And just like, and <clears throat> I, my philosophy is if you don't know how to do something, but you're hired to do what you're going to, well, you better work your butt off. <laughs> yeah. To, you know, because I'm not going to let you down. And so I had about, I think it was nine months to do that uh, film. And I needed every, because it's animated, so I'm, I'm making up everything from scratch. And being animated, there's nothing real and it's a fantasy kind of film anyway. So you're really, you know, having to make stuff up. And so I started watching other films and looking at the sound. And I always tell you know people I went out and saw um, uh, the Dark Crystal, the Muppet film. Yeah. And it was like, oh god, I love that film. And I said, yeah, it was shit. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I, it's like I love the Muppets and all stuff. But well, they needed the, the labyrinth. Sound, it was they were one shy there. Yeah. Yeah, but there was never a. Uh, I never felt like I was in a different world. And I blame that on the sound because all the right. sound was real one dimensional. There wasn't much to it. And so I said, okay. This is what everybody thinks is really cool. I've got to really up my game and blow this thing out of the water. All right. And I think that I did. I mean, it was, it was lots of complex effects and lots of, and we're still working in thirty-five millimeter film at this point. Yeah. No what's the, what's the setup here this time? That's what I was. It's all, it's all thirty-five millimeter magnetic film all right. and on reels, just like the picture is, and on a flatbed uh, editor editing machine, which meant I could never hear more than two tracks at once. And what about so, the dialogue audio for this? Did you have to develop that in post, or was that done when they were doing a lot of the live action? No, they were doing. Lot, yeah, they shot the live action in a studio recording studio. Yeah. And that's just to get the dialogue tracks. Oh, okay. So right, they're doing it. that, and then we're cutting the to get the lip sync right. You cut the actor who's you know performing, mm-hmm. doing the dialogue because they are performing even though they're just performing against a, a, a grid. Um, so we would cut that all together, make it a corner mm-hmm. film, and then you'd give that shot uh, mm-hmm. of the actor lips uh, with uh, you know speaking to the animators, and they had a little movie scope by each set, and they could go through frame by frame. And look at the mouth movements over the different words, and we had to do these log sheets for them. So uh, the log sheets would be at, at frame 14. It's the beginning of the M, or you know, and you're writing this down over how long a, a word takes over how many frames. All right. And so they're looking at the log sheet with with everything broken down phonetically. And they're looking at the picture, and a lot of the animators would have a little mirror there, so they would make that, you know, they would say the words and do all this stuff, and then they would adjust the mouths on the characters to reflect them. It's very, very cool work, very time-consuming. I don't have the kind of patience, but they would do that. So while Mike, who was the other picture editor on the film, was working on cleaning up and cutting dialogue, I was doing all the effects, background, sound, everything. And this was a real effects heavy thing. And I think in uh, something like nine months, I took less than 16 days off. And that included like the weekends. I was working through the weekends because I was on, and we, you know, we weren't making much, um, but we believed in this film. And so when the film came out, it got finished and came out, uh, a lot of people saw it. It did, never did well at the box office, uh, which is neither here nor there. I run into people now, uh, kids who saw, who people who saw it when they were kids. What year did it come out that. exactly? Again? Put me in, put me in the box. Eighty six, maybe. Okay, okay. eighty five, eighty six. Um, but uh, because there's a couple of sequences that I used to show when I would teach sometimes. One's called The Mysterious Stranger. And all these you know, people saying, oh, God, that scared the hell out of me when I was a kid. <laughs> and I was like, and that's what we intended. Yeah. Um, but uh, one of the people who saw the film at the premiere was Gus Van Sant. And we were friends at that point anyway because he was making short films and I was starting making short films and all that stuff. And so, and he did Drugstore and they told him who to work with on Drugstore. He didn't have a lot of say on some of it. Uh, but when he did Mine Private Idaho, he called me up and said, I want you to do sound on it uh, because he liked my work and respected my work. So it was just like through the, like more of like the Portland film community? 
like you you all kind of cross paths up here because it's just so just such a small pond up here you know what i mean was that there are some amazing people doing some amazing stuff up here and we've got some academy award winners but yeah. uh, a couple of amazing cinematographers live up here who you know two of them started with gus uh, eric edwards and john campbell john has passed away uh, but eric is still working and eric shot kids okay uh, but he shot so many at copland i mean eric edwards is, is an amazing cinematographer so was john um, you know, there's uh, there's amazing animation going on. There's a lot. We have an amazing talent pool up here in Portland, and people don't think about it or don't realize it. Uh, and then the whole crew that I would put together to do all the sound, most of the people that I worked with, because I have a crew of, say, 10, a lot of the editors were L.A. refugees, people who had left L.A. and were living up here for whatever reason. Uh, and, and they were doing location sound or they're doing sound editing and all that other stuff. And so, you know, I felt like we ha we had a really, really deep pool. If anything, it might be deeper now. Uh, I don't know because I'm not as involved in the local film scene anymore. Uh, excuse me. Um, you know, I've got my own stuff going on. but And it's also, uh, you have to make a decision in my mind. I made a decision when I looked around at one point. Who was working and who wasn't? Well, the people that were all working regularly were people who were not relying on Portland for their work. They were pulling work in from other places yeah. and other parts of the country. And I went, that's what I need to do. So when I left Wills and, and became, I left after Mark Twain and became a freelance, I started looking at other markets, other places to pull work in. And that's when I was really making my own films. And I started, and then, which, uh, uh, when I started touring with my films and traveling the country, most of the work I get anymore is not from Portland. Uh, it's rare that I work on a Portland film. I'm still working on all sorts of stuff. All so the time. yeah, you're still working in. You still do sound design for films currently, right? Right. I mean, even like but, last year, this year, right? Uh, right now. Okay. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the middle right. of working on yeah. one. But um, and and one of the ones I'm working on right now is is a local filmmaker who I do know. But for the most part, I would say you know my my work comes from D.C. It comes from Virginia. It comes from Austin. It comes from California. It comes from Houston. It comes from uh, and so I'm really lucky because when things slow down here I usually have enough work from other places and I think and I've been told this by a few film you know people that I know here most people in the film business anymore don't even know I exist or that I'm still around <laughs> and I'm not that old um, <clears throat> but it's because I don't participate in a lot of the stuff that's going on I am usually under deadline but it's deadline on a feature out of you know my friend Michelle has made a film in Houston doing that um i'm finishing up a film for my friend melissa and she's in kentucky you know and so it's like i'm still working and i don't necessarily go out of my way in in town to let people know that i'm working or that i'm around uh some people do some people you know don't i, I don't think about it um but i think that the smart thing that i did personally was i expanded um, my, I don't know, do you call it my market, my marketplace? I, I know so many people all over the country that, you know, so many friends of mine in other parts of the country, it's like, you know, we need someone to do sound, let's call Kelly and see if he's available, I think. And, and now anymore, because I still love independent films and independent features, um, I don't do commercial work anymore. I don't do a lot of the stuff that I used to do uh, because I found that with the business changing, you know, when I used to direct commercials and those kind of things, you know, you'd be out there shooting the, the commercial and you'd have one or two people from the agency and it would be great. And now I hear that it's just like mass quantities of agency people and they're all standing behind you, second guessing you and all that stuff. And it's like, I don't need that shit. Yeah, it's kind of difficult to work with a lot of student ties and no vision. Right. And, and, and usually they just complicate things and uh, you're there for a reason. They're there for their own. You know? Right, yeah. right. <laughs> and you know, and I, I, you know, I've, I've told people in the past to an agencies back in the day, the commercials and the work that I've done that have won tons of awards are the ones that usually the agency had just kind of let me run with. And so it's like, stop second guessing me. Let me do what I do. You know, I've been doing this now. I've been doing this stuff for 40 plus years. I like to think that I'm, I'm getting better at what I do. I'm pretty good, you know. Um, and, and that's one of those things where I will never say I'm great. It's I know a little bit. I know a lot more than most people, but there's so much more to learn. Well, when when you all, you know, the films that you worked on with Gus and then later you went to work on with Todd, and we'll talk about that too. But yeah. 
I want to drive into Bird Dog at some point, but before we get there, you know, what was the, when you start, all of a sudden you're working on these, these larger films and you're working on, like we talk about these 96 channel boards at some point, you know, they're flying you around, you're doing all kinds of stuff. What does this open your eyes to? Because the angry filmmaker comes to exist at po- some point, but he's he's not quite with us yet. So where at this point in your life, where do you what does this open your eyes to? The positive and negative of going into this Hollywood experience here. There's a ton of money to be made, and you have to, uh, you know, say goodbye to your integrity, maybe, uh, and maybe that might, <laughs> that might be a little bit harsh um, with that. But you know, I made great money doing that stuff. But I also spent more time in meetings and people giving us their ideas who, you know, should not have been giving us their ideas. But since they were the studio, they were this, they were the, you know, you have to treat them. Um, I got tired of not doing what I wanted to do. And when we were, you know, working on the small films, independence and all that stuff, we had fun. We were bending the rules we were probably even with idaho and things like that we were breaking the rules we were doing the stuff that we wanted to do because we felt i felt i'd like to say we but i don't know how you know it's like hollywood was bloated hollywood was this hollywood and don't get me wrong i love hollywood hollywood is a factory for entertainment and what they do they do really really well and i still love some hollywood films Right, but with independent films, the promise of independent films was artistic visions, and it was doing things different and doing subjects and, and making those about subjects that the studios and mainstream is not going to do. And I'm still 100% there. A lot of my peers moved over and went, yeah, all this money is really, really good, and I've got an entourage and it's all cool. Yeah. Uh, and I went, I can't work like this anymore. And what I, after I did my last, you know, big film, uh, and I said, I'm done. I'm not going to do the big movies anymore. I'm not going to do, I took a 95% pay cut for probably the next five years. And, and I was starving. I mean, I was broke. I was just bare. I was making my own films, but just barely getting by. Uh, and I'd never been happier. Uh, and that's me. That's, you know, I mean, other people are going to look at you differently or look at that whole thing differently. And like I said, my friends who went on and are entrenched in Hollywood and doing all that stuff, you know, more power to them. And I'm hoping they're successful. And I'm hoping they're getting what they want. But that wasn't me. Well, that's when we start getting the angry filmmaker. I mean, you know, your, Pretty much. your, your work with Gus Van Zandt, it led to some blockbuster credits, you know, as a supervising sound editor right. in films like Goodwill Hunting and Finding Forrester. But your true interest was in creating your own feature film. Yeah, when we last spoke before this interview, you had emphasized the importance of storytelling. How does this factor into the making of your first feature, Bird Dog? It's all about the story. If you don't have a good story, who cares? And I tell people, it's like when you walk out of a movie... And you say, you know, God, I really love the music in that thing, or I really love the acting, or I really loved the cinematography. The filmmakers failed. They absolutely failed. If you walk out of that theater or your screening or whatever it is, and you are talking about the story, that's a good movie. And that's what a movie should be. All that other stuff gets in the way. I always tell people, you know, if you want, if you, people used to say, you know, oh, I love the sound in such and such a film, you know, and they say that to me. You talked sound about guy. this pretentious comments people have given well, you. And, and I don't look at it as pretentious. I think they're trying to have something to say to me or say, well, I'm sure he goes to the movies and just listens to the sound. Like hell I do. <laughs> the last thing I want to do when I go to the movies is listen to the sound. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. want to fall into the story. I want to, you know, be blown away the way I was when I used to watch westerns and, you know, movies with my dad. Um, but if you, you know, it's like if you're talking about the sound, then it wasn't a good film. So you're, when, then the story then. Let's talk about the story with Bird Dog. Right, you're, 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 you know, you, you got all this stuff going on. You're working in sound design primarily, but you're trying, you've got the money now. You're trying to get back to what you want to do. I never had the money. Well, well, you thought you, but, but okay, well, you think you had the money. All right, I let me, let's. I had the money. I was trying. <laughs> So you think you had the money to make this feature, right? Now, right. I wasn't going to slam it that way. You want to do this, let's do it. <laughs> no, all right. Now, then, then we get there to where to where you're making Bird Dog. When, when's, this, uh, when's the story come to play? And I know a little bit about the history of the story, but when do you start writing this thing down? When are you like, all right, I've got to make this shit. But it always starts with movies. Starts, you're writing it down first. Right. So when do you start putting pen to paper? 
and what comes two through. years before I made the film. What's I going on around writing. you, though? You're like busy I'm, as I'm, hell. How are you find right. time to write a screenplay? It was a story I had to tell. I had to tell the story in my own, you know, way of, of Vanport. Uh, and, and I thought it was an important story. And I'd done the short films, and I was done with the short films. Uh, and it was kind of like, what's next? And I thought, well, there's a story here. And, you know, and I took uh, a lot of, uh, lee- you know, a lot of leeway with the story. But um, I wanted to make it. I didn't want to do a documentary. I wanted to make it dramatic. And so, you know, I started structuring. Uh, what people don't understand is by the time we started rehearsing Bird Dog, and the script was 114 pages, I think. All right. By the time we started rehearsing Bird Dog, I was on draft 14. And I probably wrote three or four more drafts between rehearsal with the actors and actually shooting the film. Now, what's your approach as far as uh, we're talking? Because, you know, anytime you're writing a screenplay, like you say, you're, you're hacking that motherfucker up and you're putting it back together to refine it. When when you got when you actually started working and getting into rehearsals, when you began to rewrite the like after the seventeenth or so, are you trying to fit it to the actors at that point a little more? Are you seeing what's coming out of their mouths and are you starting to learn them and incorporate them into the screenplay? Yes and no in that, and I will tell you, you know, as a filmmaker, as a writer, there is nothing cooler than sitting in a rehearsal and hearing these amazing words coming out of these actors' mouths. Especially when it works, you think, "Oh God, yeah, oh I wrote that. Oh God, that's brilliant. I wrote that. I wrote." And then you hear a line that just hits like an anvil. Yeah, I was like, "Yeah, shit, I wrote that." Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but those are the those are that's what you're listening for. Yeah, so you can say, "Okay, I got to fix that. I got to rewrite that. I got to, you know." And so the first couple of rehearsals were really read throughs. And so we're reading through the entire script, and I'm thinking, this works, this doesn't work. God, that's beautiful. And, you know, I had my cast, but I'm still tweaking, and and I got to know my cast. And that's one of the things that I do with any of my films is I get to know the actors, and I know a lot of actors now, So, excuse me, so that I can tailor to them. And I get them involved because I think that they can play this particular role. There's something about it. Uh, that does it. And so we have lots of discussions before, and I do rehearse in my films and rewrite and change that. But we're also, I'm rewriting on set too, because there are times you get to location or you get some places like, yeah, this isn't going to work. And so, you know, you're rewriting. And in the case of Kicking Bird, we're shooting, uh, we're shooting this one particular scene uh, towards the end of the movie. And, you know, everything's shot out of sequence. Okay. But yeah. We, I was going to ask that. Yeah. yeah. We, we shoot this one scene and I went, oh, shit, my ending doesn't work. Mm. And I have to shoot my ending in three days. So this is where you rewrite it. And so it's kind of like, okay, I can't. And it was because of the performances that I got in this one scene, and they were fantastic. But I suddenly realized with this stuff, it's like, okay, this is it for this character. He can't come back in the ending now. He cannot. And But I had him in the end, and it's like, oh, man. Are you talking about his best friend? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. And so for the next, like, two nights, you know, I'd finish shooting, and I'd be up, you know, writing late at night, trying to get what's the end. How do I get the ending? How do we get? And it was really on the last day when we were going to shoot the ending. The day before, I'd called up the best friend, uh, and Andrew, and said, you're not in the ending. You know, I, I've changed that. You da, da, da. And he's like, oh, was there something? I was like, no. And, you know, we talked about it on the phone. You were brilliant. Yeah. And so that's he, why. He was really good. And who put him in that L.A. gun shirt, Kelly? <laughs> who put him in that shirt? Uh, I'm going to say Mary Chris Mass. That's, that's what's up. Good choice. Yeah. Mary, yeah Mary, <laughs> Mary, Mary Chris was my costume designer. Yeah. She did that. Uh, and that was a great choice. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, uh and so it's like the next day we're going to shoot the last big scene and it's, you know, Super Bowl Sunday and we're at a park where we don't have permission and on and on and on and on, and on all the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and it's like, oh, by the way, here's some new pages. <laughs> we're doing this different now. And the cast like, huh? And, you know, part of the crew was like, huh? And I thought, well, I couldn't tell them beforehand because I didn't have it yet. Yeah. And I was still, you know, working on And I didn't want to say before, you know, I had it. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm changing the ending, everybody. It's kind of like, <laughs> you know, here we go. And this is how this is going to play out. And this is how, you know, and you're going to be here and you're not. Because everybody's like, well, where's Andrew? And it's like, he's done. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, and, and I always felt bad for him. But, but you've seen the movie. He goes out on a high note. Yeah. That's a great, his last scene, he's great. Yeah. And it breaks your heart. 
And that's why I couldn't bring him back, you know, because like I said, it's... When and you, you saw it, you to, just saw that that was the end of it. Like with him, you saw that was where his character had finalized, this essentially. You know? Yeah, and it was through his performance. Yeah. And that's another thing. We we did like three takes on on his close-up doing that. And uh, and we're on a tight schedule. And the third take was really, really good. And but I but I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, there's one more take in there. There's there's one more. He can do this better. And I said, we're going to do one more take. And my cinematographer said, well, we've got it. It's good. We need to move on. And I said, no, one more take. And he's like, no, 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 we have to move on. And, I just, and you know, we rarely raise our voices. But at this particular instance, I said, you're the DP, I'm the director and the producer. Oh, you had to pull rank. Yeah. And I yeah. said, <laughs> I do this sometimes. Yeah, we're <laughs> doing, but it's like, we're doing this one more time. You keep everybody here and everybody quiet. Andrew, come with me for a moment. Yeah. And he and I walked outside the back patio, and I had a little conversation with him very, very quietly. And he's listening, and he's kind of nodding his head. Okay, and we come back in. And I can feel a little bit of hostility <laughs> from the DP you know, as I come back in. Yeah. But it's like, nah, uh mm-mm. And so we do it one more time. And he was fantastic. And that was, that was the take, you know, we used for all this stuff. And when I finally said cut, I looked over at the DP and he's got tears coming down his cheek. And he looked at me and he said, so everybody could hear him. The next time I tell you we're finished and it's good enough, tell me to go to hell. Mm. Does that, did that ever come? Do you ever get the opportunity to do that? No, 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 <laughs> no. Part of it is, you know, we're, we're really good friends. Yeah, uh, I haven't yeah. seen him in a while, but. It's he, at least he knew, you know, he knew. He's he, like, all right. Yeah, he he knew that. And, you know, he'd worked with a lot of different people and stuff. And, you know, and he would sometimes mm-hmm. over a beer, he'd say, you know, I keep forgetting that you know so much more than most of these other directors that I work with that I don't have to be checking on this. And you've already done that. Now you, and, you, you worked together on, on three, all three, three films. Features. So he worked with yeah. you on Bird Dog, too, then. Yeah, yeah. What, um, what about the shorts? No. No. No, uh, he used to shoot, he was the assistant camera on a bunch of stuff, that I did, commercials and stuff that I did. I used a couple of different people in the shorts. Mm. Didn't know him that well until I got into commercials and some other stuff. And I actually met him when I was a picture editor, a young guy at the time. I think he was 19 when he started doing this stuff. And uh, there's uh, 10, 15 years age difference now. So, so now he's an old dude too. Um, but, um, you know, it's... He was he was an amazing assistant and he worked for a lot of the cinematographers. But I just I always felt like he could shoot, he could be a DP. But uh, when you're an assistant in any part of the business, I think the people that you're working for do not want to give you the opportunity to move up. Yeah. Because if I'm a director of photography and I've got this amazing assistant, the last thing I want to do is let them, he or she, shoot a film. Because then I'm not going to have a good assistant. I'm going to have to go find another one. Yeah. And so it's really kind of bullshit like that? No, you're right. I mean, like, I go on sets and, and fuck up everything and right. then recite Shakespeare. Yeah. So hoping I get an acting job. It hadn't worked out because I'm not good at Shakespeare either. <laughs> but, no, but, gotta, but no, I'm, you but I'm following this. what you mean. You I'm gotta rethink you. this. Yeah. Your, your, your approach. Rethink that approach. But that's the thing. So that's what happens. So you get too good at one thing. You're getting hung up in there. Right, right. And, yeah. that, and that's really a Hollywood thing. I mean, I have some friends I went to school with who are amazing cinematographers. Uh, but when they got out and, you know, got into the union, got into the business, whatever it was, you always start off at the bottom and you work your way up. But those people became such great assistants or operators that so many of them never got the opportunity to shoot their own thing. And usually you'd have to go off and do an independent thing by, you know, uh, to prove that you could do this. And some people didn't, some people didn't. Uh, but it's so it's always kind of a, a, a surprise. It's always kind of a... You know, because when we were young and we were all in film school, we all wanted to make movies. That's why we were there. But while you're in school, you learn, I really like cinematography. I really like editing. I really like, and so you start branching off. Um, But a lot of the people that, you know, I went to school with, you know, we're going to become filmmakers and we're going to do all that stuff. And, you know, 40 years down the line, you look where the dust has settled and some some do, some don't. And it's just, I think it's just life. Yeah. Well, your ideas for Bird Dog were largely centered around the history of Vanport, Oregon. What was it about Vanport's history that appealed to you in developing a screenplay focused on it? 
Any time I would tell people about Vanport, Oregon, nobody knew what the hell I was talking about. Uh, and at the time when Vanport was destroyed in the flood, it was Oregon's second largest city. Um, and it was the home to mostly African Americans, uh, Hispanics, and what you'd call your poor white trash. It was built, the city was built uh, for, to house workers for the shipyard, shipyards during World War II. Had this huge influx in. As we all know, Oregon has a huge history of racism. And Oregon was, at the time, one of the whitest states, and it was mandated that way by the Constitution. Yeah. You know, if you were a minority of any sort, you could not own property. You, they didn't want you here. There was like a point where, like, it, like it was an anti, like an anti-black state. Oh yeah. oh yeah, 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 oh yeah, and it was in the Constitution. Yeah, the state constitution. Um, but my father would tell me these stories about Vanport, um, and I started reading about it. It's like well, this is kind of interesting. And then um, there's a line in the film uh, because you know the the dikes give way and the whole city was destroyed. And my father told me, and I when I told I, I took what he told me. Um, my father spent three days out there filling sandbags. It was after the war uh, to help shore up the dikes because the dikes were starting to crumble. Uh, and one of the characters in the film says to the main character, you know, your dad and I spent three days out there yeah. filling sandbags. Well, that was my dad. And my dad had friends out there. You know, he could go out and play baseball. He started at Vanport College, which eventually became Portland State. But I thought, here's this interesting bit of Oregon history that we don't talk about. And a lot of it has to do with race, I, I believe. Yeah. Now, uh, there were a lot of people who didn't agree with me when the film came out, but, you know, so be it. Um, but I just thought that was such an important story to tell. Now, I fictionalized it in. I added the car that had evidence that the dams were intentionally. And there were always these theories uh, about were those dikes sabotaged and on and on and on and on and on. And who knows? Um, but I decided to use that as the linchpin so that I could talk about this city. And that's why at the beginning of the film, there's that title that says this film is dedicated uh, to the the people, the survivors, and the city of Vanport, Oregon. Well, it does, uh, like, it has its own mythos in a way. I mean, like, when I does. first moved uh, here, you know, about a decade ago, um, a man who had gone to Grant High School, he was at the time, you know, he was about 65 years old, so mm -hmm. he was he was familiar he was with it. He was a young man. Yeah, 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 but he was, but, you know, um, he was, but he was familiar with it. We were down in Delta, Par or, uh, Delta yeah. Park one day, yeah. and we were going to what then was a cash and carry. And he started telling me the story of Anport and the, and the legend there. So that's yeah. kind of how I became incorporated. But it had that sort of the the same storyline that you were telling. Now, but because of that, there's always been this like kind of controversy around it. But you like controversy, Kelly. So like, what is not really controversy? I say, but provocation. So when it comes to like. The controversies that stem from your focus on the details behind the city being flooded out in the mid twentieth century. Like, what sort of opinion? What what feedback did you get when you put this in? You know, once again, people liked it or hated it. <clears throat> I was told by uh, quite a few people that that was outrageous. That didn't happen, and nobody died, and this and this and that. Uh, <clears throat> and I was told by some people you told our story. Yeah, how many people were um, like, I never fucking knew about this. Most people, most people didn't. But what was interesting was. Uh, <clears throat> when I mixed the film down in uh, Berkeley, Salsa Anza's place, yeah. uh, Richmond, California, okay. was also built during the war for the shipyard workers. That city has stayed and you know done all sorts of amazing things, uh, and it's a big port now. But um, <clears throat> you know there were other places like this that were built just for the war, and you know the people of Portland wanted it bulldozed when the war was over, send all those people home. I mean that's all true, and. Uh, you know, how can we do that? How can we, you know, uh, it's, we're all people. We all want the same thing, ultimately, I believe. Uh, and if you, you know, if people are uncomfortable with the history and all that other stuff, that's, I think, even more why we need to tell it and why it needs to be out there is if it's something that makes you uncomfortable, why? And what? how do we change that? We don't change it by not talking about it. We change that by discussing it and saying what went right, what went wrong, what can we do better? And I think all of my films have that element of, you know, what what can we do better? What can we, well, it's, I don't know about the gas cafe, but anyway, yeah. you know, it's, um, I think that that's, and, you know, and, and that is part of the angry filmmaker. Part of the whole thing is that these stories need to be told. They should be told. I think now more and more, because I made that film in 98, more and more we're getting those stories. Uh, but in 98, it was kind of unheard of that I was in 
you know, and people were, a lot of people were shocked when they met me that you made that film, um, you know, because I, 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 for whatever reason, people think I don't look like I, I should be making films like that. I don't know. It's just kind of a weird, weird thing. Um, but, you know, I, I grew up working class, basically. I mean, my father sold used cars. My mother worked in a bank. You know, we didn't have much money. And, you know, I feel like I, I tell working class stories. You know, and my, the people that I write about, the people that I grew up with, the people that I knew a lot of them, you know, were the workers. What, what as far as when you began to in, see what Ver, Bird Dog was on, on screen, or, you know, when you're developing the film and seeing the responses you're getting versus what you would put on the paper. Did, did the movie transition or become anything that you hadn't seen before? Was there something that, did, did it gain its own enigma and something that allowed you to, hmm, how am I driving this thing now? I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, I made the film that I intended. Is it exactly the way I wanted? Of course not. It's maybe 50% of what I'd hoped it would be. You know, the, you have that, you've written this thing and you've got this in your head and it's going to be this. And then you shoot it and you're thinking, okay, shit, how can I fix this? What would it, what, what, what I mean, it, and that's with any film. With any film, we always have these high hopes. Yeah. Um, what and did you so, feel like you had to compensate there? What are some things you wish you wouldn't have, or what are some things you wish you would have been able to do? Um, you know, it's 20 years ago. I don't, I don't think, 25 years ago almost, uh, I don't think about it. Um, but, you know, there were things that, I, you know, there's, there's some of the acting I'm not wild about. There's this, I mean, there's all sorts of things. But, you know, making a film is all about compromise. And sometimes compromises make it better, sometimes not so. You know, and I, but I just think when you look at your own work, if you can't always say... I can improve on that, then what are you doing? Nothing we ever do is perfect. And so walking away, you know, and it was it was probably about a year later when I was I was queuing up some scenes because I had to go do some talk show or something. Yeah. And they wanted to show some clips. And I was queuing some stuff up. And it was like six o'clock in the morning, I'm in the living room and I'm high speeding through this stuff and I found this scene and I found this scene. And all of a sudden it just hit me. You know, and I said, you know, you made a pretty good film. You did okay. And I, and I actually broke down crying. And that was the first time that I had stopped long enough to think about what I had done, what I had accomplished, where I had started, and how I got to. And it was really kind of a, you know, thank God nobody was there to see my epiphany, you know, or to see the tears. But I mean, it just, it really just hit me all of a sudden. It's like, oh my God, look what you did. And it's not just look what I did, because obviously I had a cast, I had a crew. I mean, I had so much help and so many amazing people. But it's your personal, you know, you accomplished right. your personal vision of what you wanted to do. Right. Yeah. And, and like I said, and I can look at all of the films and say, you know, I did okay. I did okay. I'm now, you know, and that's, if I can say I did okay, that's the best it can be, right? I mean, for me, I'm not going to say, oh man, I am fucking brilliant. You know, because I, I, I don't feel that way. I feel like there's still much more to learn and do. I mean, you know, so we, we read about the challenges that you ran into making Bird Dog. Mm -hmm. In your book, The Angry Filmmaker, that's the first book mainly that you discuss right. it, you know, more because you're talking about you're giving more of guidelines on how to do this. And you're also talking very humbly about the, the, <laughs> the I wouldn't mistakes. say mistakes. <laughs> using mistakes, but they but they seem more like maybe maybe like risks that you wouldn't want to take now. Like like it seems like um Yeah. Um why do you think they're mistakes? Um I don't know, maybe mistakes is just too broad. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I think what I think I tried to show in the book and what I try to tell people is these are the things I did. These are the things that worked out. These are the things that didn't work out. They seemed like a good idea at the time, you know, and it's like, you don't you always say that seemed like a good idea at the time right before they put the handcuffs on you? Yeah, that's a lot. A lot of the book is, a lot of the book is like, is a, is a hindsight 2020 sort of event. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's, and so, but if I can tell other filmmakers or other people who want to do this, beware, this seems like it's good, but it's not. Don't do what I did, you know, then I feel like I'm trying to, I'm trying to help other people. Well, when you, when you... Revisit the financial risks that you took in creating Bird Dog, and and how you you, you talk about some of what you you struggle gaining distribution for the film, and you know, and that story is a little more complicated than it is just straightforward, you know. But are these some of these are some of the influences, you know, that lead to you writing the Angry Filmmakers Guide? But what what more is at play there? What more is at play? 
Um, you know, I did make mistakes. I did screw up. Uh, I, I listened to people and I trusted people that I shouldn't have. Okay. I think we all do that. But when people say, we're going to help. This is great. It's so good. You know, it's you have to move forward and say, they said they're going to help, but if they don't, what's going to happen if they don't? You know, you have to look at. But I was, you know, I was, I was determined. You know, at that point, I'm going to make this film. It's going to get into Sundance. I'm going to get a three picture deal. I'll probably be, you know, dating a Hollywood starlet. I mean, all of that stuff. You know, and obviously, none of that happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and it's good that none of that happened. Um, but you really see yourself me... rolling around like that? I just don't no. see that in you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm, you know, but I'm. <clears throat> when you're talking to filmmakers, they all want to get into Sundance, and I always say, why? You know. Um, but. You know, we have these uh, these uh, dreams, you know, and at the time, uh, you know, in the late 90s, Sundance was like a a good thing. Yeah. Right. Not like it is anymore. But um, and so I think that, you know, uh, I, I think that I, I thought we would get the film into a couple of high pre- high profile film festivals. And I thought that uh, there'd be some distributors who wanted the film and would want to bankroll my next film. Uh, and of course, that didn't happen. Uh, we had a lot of distribution screenings, and distributors loved the film, yeah. but there was nobody famous in it. There's this, there's this. I mean, you know, on and on and on, uh, which told me it's like, oh, they're lazy. They can't promote a film that is based on a good story because they all thought the story was good, the execution was great, but how do we sell it? Um, and so, you know, I think that that also really uh, helped with the development of The Angry Filmmaker. But I so you know, I, I lost my house. I lost, you know, I mean, all, I did all the financial stuff that I shouldn't have done. Uh, do I have any regrets? I'm beating you to the question on that one, both of you. Uh, no. I made, a, I made a good movie. And I always used to ask myself, you know, you're a filmmaker. Are you really, are you willing to put it all down and to risk it all to make your your film? Your, and I don't have to ask myself that question anymore because I did. I lost, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> well, you, when you say when you say you lost, I mean, like, I, so so you leveraged you leveraged against it, and it didn't right. really factor out. But I mean, but right. in the sense of like like the like. I'm being metaphorical because we're talking about your house to, in some ways, right. but like it didn't really like fall in on you that way. It just kind of set you back. But you also like to me when you talk about and your art tours kind of approach or like right. filmmaking approach. Now I don't want to inflate this in any way, in a sense. But but like when I, th- I think of Orson Welles, Deflating. all right, I'm trying. No, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. No, but but I'm trying to uh, but I'm trying to think about uh, the sense like where you know. Even even when you talk about your work in sound design, as soon as you you have the money to even to even get in the ballpark of what you want to do with the film, that's what you go and do. And then even when you even when it hits you in a certain way, you, you decide that you're going to develop a new unique approach and you're going to begin to do this your own way continuously. So to you, and and I see this like I was saying with with Orson Welles, he was always just looking for another way to make a film. You okay. know what I mean? But with and I don't want to bank you with Orson Welles. He got a little crazy in the end. But but it's a thing, you know. Um, but which it, is still possible. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, I got time. <laughs> is there a script to this? <laughs> no one knows. Call John Houston. No, but um, but uh, there's a thing where where when it comes down to it, uh, you you're always focused on what you can do creatively next. So you know when we when we talked in the beginning, you know, it, the whole filmmaking thing began as this kind of what the fuck someone see and hey you can do this. But at some point that took over, and you start to find almost this addictive necessity to be able to create. You know, like the, the mm-hmm. be damned the rest of it surrounding it. But at some point, there's a little more structure to that. You're like, all right, I'm not going to f- fucking burn the bridge every time I do it. <laughs> right. So <laughs> you've only got so many houses you can lose. Yeah. So at that point, <laughs> when do you? That's when the, that's when you start design coming up with this idea for alternatives. What happens in that down period b- with Bird Dog and you going, hey, I'm going to do this a different way? Um, you know, I think that. There might have been some disappointment because Bird Dog did not meet or didn't was not accepted the way I'd, I'd hoped it would be. Um, but you know, and and everybody told me you you know you got to make a, if you're going to make an independent film, it's got to have three million dollars and stars and you da, da, da. And so yeah, I, I turn around and make a film for you know what two thousand dollars, and uh, you've never heard of anybody shot in eight nights. Um, because, and I guess part of it is I, I, I've always looked at the punk ethic, yeah. which is the whole DIY thing. And it's just like, I am not going to wait for somebody to say, here's your money. 
go off and do what you wish. You know, it's kind of like, I'm going to just, I've got these ideas. I'm going to grab them. I'm going to figure out how to get them done. And I'm just going to go do it. And if you have a problem with that, oh, well, uh, I'm just going to do the things that I want to do, create the things that I want to create, make things I want to, you know, because of that, I do take on sound design work. I take on some of this other stuff. Um, you know, John Sayles is a filmmaker I admire. You know, he's a script doctor. He, you know, fixes scripts for people. And that's how he's able to make his films too. And he makes his films even today with not a whole lot of money. And I think that that's a viable alternative. Well, that's what like a lot of people have done that that have always, I mean, even like Bring It Wells Up Again or right. John Cassavetes and his wife were great for that. They were like, all right, let's go find some bullshit role in Hollywood so we can right. go make one of our cool independent films. Right, it's really right. And, and I think that there, you know, to me, that is the, the way independent filmmaking needs to be done. Now with the people we talk about and you talk about, you know, they also have a high degree of skill. Yeah. Uh, and, and they are able to get really talented people to work with them. And I think that that's really key. Uh, and like once again, I've gotten to work with some amazing people. And I, and I think the world of them and the fact that they believe in me and trust me to say, yeah, let's go do this thing. Okay, I'm in. You know, and it's kind of like it's 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 light years away from let's put a show on and, you know, my grandpa's got a barn and, you know, we'll get some seats for a curtain. You know, I mean, but you're still asking people to come and, you know, and ultimately, I think at the end of the day, I'm asking people to believe in me, believe in my work and come and work with me and let's do something. And you're not going to make a lot of money on all this stuff. But the the goal is that you're going to do good work. And, you know, it, it's what I want to do. I want to do good work. Uh, and sometimes the budget does get in the way. It's why I'm writing fiction now more so. Because I don't have to raise money to write a book. Now, this know? happened. We talked to a lot of like people like, screen, like Courtney Joyner, who wrote for Mark Lester in different films in the 80s. Right. He, he, started, he writes shit ton of, you know, stuff. He does a lot of commentary work. And stuff, yeah. So everybody gets into unique little things. Like, it's so you've done a lot of compilation short stories, or a couple, yeah. And you've written a lot about your experiences too. But yeah. you've also, you know, you you're just an avid reader anyway. I mean, when we were over at your spot, you've been kind of having this project with K Boyle on the side, and yeah. you know, your dog's named after Thor in the Wilder. So you, <laughs> you know, we could we could dive off into some literature for a while if we, we could, wanted. But we could. But that's a big component of who you are as well when it comes to uh, your approach into filmmaking. Is I, I I think so. And and once again, it'll come back to what you said earlier about storytelling yeah. it's all about storytelling be it on paper be it on screen be you know whatever and and it's anymore it's like yes i'm an author yes i'm a filmmaker you know i'm all these other sound designer but i think ultimately i'm a storyteller and i am not real choosy anymore as far as the medium you know i've always been tempted to write a play i'm scared to death to do it <laughs> or write a one-person show why why are you scared to death to do it that's not my genre. That's not my, I love going to the theater. I love watching plays, but imagine, you know, uh, how would I do it? And so, you know, because it frightens me, sooner or later I'm going to do it. All right. You know, I mean, it's just because it's like, it's so out of my wheelhouse that I need to do it. That's your high dive. All right. You know, it's, we only live once, you know, and it's like, and if I bomb, I bomb. That's true. You know, I mean, and I have, I don't, after all these years, I certainly have no fear of failure. I've done that enough. We we need to start like a, a Wall Street bets for filmmaking. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sold this spec script and it just tanked. <laughs> but, you know, I, I went to school with so many people who did sell scripts yeah. that, you know, didn't go anyplace or people who are writing. Well, people sell scripts all the time and they hit the trash. I mean, it's they, they, they play it like options at a lot of these. You know, they'll, they'll throw out right. a half a million on a script and throw it in the trash. And right. at that point, it decides where you... Where you care enough about your work as being seen as opposed to paying, getting paid, I guess. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's why I self-distribute my films, but I also, you know, self-publish my books. And yeah. I don't say self anymore. I don't use that. I say I independently distribute my films and I independently publish my work because when you say self, that sounds amateur. It's Not like, oh, nobody, nobody will publish your work. Nobody will distribute it. It's like, no, I don't want anybody to. I'm not going to sit, once again, I'm not going to sit around waiting for some magic agent or editor to say, your work is good enough. Go ahead. We will, we will, you know, accept it. It's like, no, fuck you. You know, we are not fledgling at all. You're just, this is a style. I mean, yeah, yeah, but, but it's, but it's also, I've written these stories. I want people to read them. How do I do that? Well, I can, you know, sit around for three years while people decide whether they want to do it or not, or I can, 
you know, just do it myself. And like I said, it's love or hate Henry Rollins. I love his DIY. He publishes books. He does his speaking tours. He does whatever the hell he wants. This is true. And whether you like him or not, I personally do. Yeah. Whether you like him or not, you got to respect the dude. All right, SOA, Black Flag, or Rollins Band? I, I'm not probably going to go with Black Flag. All right, that's a safe one. That's a safe one. That's yeah. true. That's yeah. Safe. yeah. No. Uh, all the, you know, all the, there's like all the other people out there that like to obscure everything. They're like, man, that's the way. <laughs> you are liars. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's not sad. I don't like yeah. it. Yeah. We talked about Henry when we interviewed with Penelope, and she was talking about how she was mad at him for like 25 years for not taking a role in Suburbia because he didn't take the lead role. Oh, yeah. He probably would have been good, but but I totally get it because you know what? I, I don't think his self effacing thing is an act. No, it's it's definitely I think, real. I think yeah. it's real. Yeah. And I think that, you know, at the time in Suburbia, you know, I think that he was, you know, he was just learning how to be Henry Rollins. Yeah. He hadn't you know? been Henry Rollins long at all. He'd been Henry Warfield over there in Hagen Doss and yeah. DC with Minor Threat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, and you look at, you know, uh, but he worked his ass off. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that more people need to, if, if you want, if you want the career or the lifestyle that you want, I think you have to work for it. Nobody's going to hand it to you. Uh, and, and so you have to figure out what that is and what's important to you and work for it. You know, um, that's really important. Well, switching gears for a second, but if you could go back, would you really do Bird Dog differently? Or do you think that experience was something you needed in order to gain knowledge on independent filmmaking moving forward? I think the only thing I would do differently, and I'm not going to go into detail, but there's one person I would recast. Yeah. And it's a small, no, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, and it's a Fine. small role. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, it, it's a small role. It's a very, it's not one of the leads or one of the, one person I just, I never felt, but no, I had to make that. I had to have, um, life doesn't turn out how we want it to, but it always turns out how it's supposed to. And I believe that. I needed to crash and burn, if you will, uh, on Bird Dog. Uh, I, I made a, a terrific film. I still really believe in it. But all of those other things, you know, if, if, if that film had become su successful, uh, I probably wouldn't be sitting here now. I would have just been another schmuck with a movie, probably trying to get another deal in Hollywood or wherever. So you're saying it humbled you. You um, mean like it sliced your ego down uh, and made you real. Yeah, I, I don't know if I had much of an ego beforehand. <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, it certainly uh, brought me to earth. And, uh, and, you know, and I think that that was important. I, I would not... I wouldn't do anything really differently again, except for like this, I said, tiny little cast, which, you know, most people would never even notice. But every time I watch it, it's like, oh, God. Um, but no, and I, I, you know, I don't believe in redoing stuff. I don't believe in sequels for me, you know, because people, when I became a grandfather, everybody said, so you're going to make a sequel to You'll Change, right, about becoming a father. And I sat down and I thought about it and I thought, what would I say? It's a totally different thing because now it's my kid having a kid. Yeah, you can hand it back. But it's, yeah. you know, and... and <clears throat> you just yeah. play You'll Change while you're watching the TV. Yeah. That's part two. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it just, it, you know, and so um, I don't look back on any of my films and wish I could do them again. I look forward to say what's going to be the next film and what new things am I going to mess up. Or, or new things I'm going to learn. Um, but I tell people that, you know, I, I mine the past for my work. I don't live there. Makes sense. And I think that that's really important, you know, uh, especially when you hit a certain age. Because there's nothing more boring than an old dude talking about the old days. Oh, the, 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 I hate the that remember shit. when stories? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, I've got those stories because I'm old. Um, but... I, you know, you, you got to pry them out of me, you know, for that stuff. I mean, I'm, we're talking about stuff now because we're talking about the past. But it's relevant. But, it's relevant. It's not. Right, yeah. right. But I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to be. And that was the other thing with Bird Dog, too, is I told myself I didn't want to be that guy who was like 50 or 60 years old sitting in a bar saying, you know, I could have made a movie. Yeah. <laughs> but nothing happened, you know. I mean, I, I, and I blame this and I blame It's like, no, fuck it. I just made the movie. You know, uh, and uh, and so with all that stuff, it's like no regrets. Well, when you 
an afterbird dog. Or when, give me the chronology of this. So at some point you gotta go back and you start working on the remake of Psycho, doing editorial work and sound design there. Yeah. And then Finding Foresters, like there, in that kind of that ballpark right I around say, there? Uh, I think it was like a year, year and a half. We were editing, I was doing uh, the remake of Psycho and doing the sound on that. While uh, I was uh, finishing up Bird Dog in that, I was in LA, it was an LA lab that was doing all the work. And so I'd get up at my hotel room at like 5 a.m., you know, shower, drive down to the lab and work with the color timer and the negative colors and everything yeah. on all this other stuff. Uh, and then I'd have to rush over, rush back to, to, uh, Universal back up the hill uh, and to be on the stage by uh, the mixing stage by 830 because we're going to start at 9 and so I'm doing this like every morning and you know and then we would work until like 7 uh, on, on that and I'd go home and try to sleep and you know work on a few other things go back to the hotel um, and so like I said I was really burning the candle on that but at that point uh, Bird Dog was not finished I did not have a finished print I did not get that finished print until December 23rd. Two days uh, before Christmas. What year? The, the day before. Was that 99? I think it's 99, because I wrote a short story called The Night Before, The Night Before Christmas. Yeah. Uh, it was the, the night before, the night before Christmas, where I'm sitting in a bar at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel after just having seen the final print. And you know, there's nothing more depress depressing than being in a hotel lobby bar on Hollywood Boulevard, there are junkies coming in and out looking to score. There, I mean, so many weird things. And that's what this whole story is about, is just, you know, sitting there. And I just want to be home at that point because I'd been gone so much that year. Uh, just, you know, gone that, and I was missing my kid and I was, you know, missing. I don't, I don't know if I was missing a sense of normalcy because I don't think I've ever had a sense of normalcy. Yeah. But I was just so tired and... It was like 30 degrees in L.A. or something. There was ice on the streets. Mm, Nothing what? is more depressing <laughs> than being in Hollywood with these slick streets, you know, and you're sitting in the lobby bar at the – and I love the Hollywood Roosevelt. I've I never mean, been there, so – All the all the the bands. You know, I stayed there one night, uh, one time, and I came walking down to get my car, and there's no doubt waiting for their van, and they were all hungover as all get out. <laughs> It was hilarious, you know, and and the the Roosevelt, it, it's nice now. It's it's totally changed. But I remember I was when I was staying there because I always just stayed there when I get down there because it was cheap and it was right in the middle of everything. Yeah. And I remember going, you know, coming back from a screening, and a friend of mine and I walked into the lobby bar and there's like there's nobody around and it's like I don't know, it was a Thursday or something Wednesday Thursday, so we're like hey anybody here and the guy comes out and he's like sorry we're closed. And uh, and I said, you know, what do you mean? You're clo what time do you close? And he said, we close at midnight. And I said, dude, it's like ten. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, nobody's here, so we closed. And I was like, well, we're here. Well, we're closed anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And so I, you know, <laughs> I happen to love the Hollywood for all the reasons that I shouldn't. Uh, the Roosevelt, but yeah, but <laughs> now it's owned by some big chain. Well, Finding Forrester would be your final film working with Van Zandt. Yeah. It was around this time that you would get the opportunity to work with Todd Haynes on his film, Far From Heaven. Right. You previously mentioned that it was your daughter, Fiona, who would ultimately encourage you to take this job on the film. What's the story behind well, we, yeah, this? Yeah, when you told this, we had to ask you. It was such a cool story. It was <laughs> Everyone must know. Yeah. Everyone must know. It's a good one. Um, I finished Finding Forrester, and that's when I said, you know, I'm done. I, I didn't want to do the big Hollywood films anymore. And I just said, I'm finished. Don't call me anymore. And call me if you want to go out for a beer. That's what I told Gus. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I guess it was just a, about a month later, I'm in my studio and the phone rings and I pick it up and, and, and it's Todd Haynes. And it's like, why is Todd Haynes calling me? And I was a <laughs> fan of his work. Uh, I, I like his work. Nice guy. Yeah. Um, but he said, you know, I'm doing a new film and I, we just lost our sound designer and I was talking to Gus and he said, you're the guy and, you know, you'd be the perfect sound designer and to call you. And I said, did he tell you that I'm not doing this on the larger films anymore? And he said, yeah, he said that you were, but maybe I could talk you into it. So I said, well, you know, I, I do like your work. I'm a fan of your work. Send me a rough cut of the film and I'll take a look at it, you know, or whatever you have. And he said, great, I can have it to you in 15 minutes. <laughs> and I thought, 15 minutes? And I, I said, where are you? And he said, oh, I'm right down the street from you. 
and he was in town because he lives here now uh, and right. he was editing they were editing at this place down the street from where my studio was and sure enough like 15 minutes later he's knocking the door and there's this kid handing me a, you know a cassette and he takes off this is from Todd and he takes off and so I took it home and my daughter was I want to say she was probably eight at the time maybe eight uh you gotta think about this in time Do that. yeah she's probably pretty good seven or eight <clears throat> so I picked her up from school we went home and I said hey kid we got a movie to watch you know we watch this thing so we sit down and we watch it and uh, I looked at her when the movie was over, and I said, so, what do you think? Should I take this movie or not? And all eight years old of, you know, my kid, you know, kind of system and says, you know, Dad, I think you should do the picture. <laughs> so I said, okay, why? And she said, because you've never done a period piece, and this takes place in the 50s, and I think it'd be something really cool and interesting. And you've said that you're a fan, you know, you're, you're a fan of Todd's work, so I think you should do the picture. And I can remember she said, do the picture. I was like, what am I, a little Hollywood kid here or something. Yeah. So, I, you know, I called up Todd the next day, and I said, well, I was talking to my eight-year-old last night. We watched the film, and she thinks I should do the picture. So, And he's like, What? And I, he said, you're eight-year-old? And I said, well, when you meet her, you'll understand. I'm surprised he's perplexed, given the whole Barbie doll Karen Carpenter <laughs> thing. But, you know. <laughs> but that, that, one, of, one of my things, I'd forgotten about this. One of my stipulations with him was, I told him, I said, I will do this and, you know, financial, and we had to work all that stuff out. But, yeah, I said, yeah. but one of the stipulations I have is I want my own copy of the Carpenter, the Karen Carpenter really? story. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> and he's like, you're kidding. And I said, I won't show it. I won't show it because I know the legal ramifications hey. behind it. And he's like, okay. You know, and he did. He gave me a copy of it. I can't find it. Uh, it's probably in a box. How you lose that? I lo that's Trust so me, much. There's, there's a lot more stuff that's probably even worse that I've lost. Uh, but I used to have a buddy who would DJ and he, he would play Rare Records every now and again. And yeah. one time this kid came up and was like, man, that's an original copy of that. And he said, yes. So and he started going, <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> uh, it yeah. just speaks more of it to it. I get yeah. what you that. That's cool. But yeah. Period sound for the film, though. Like, isn't there a specific way you had to work to develop this? Was there like a unique approach to this? You well, of course, about... because, uh, you know, we, we live in a computer based world and, you know, with cell phones and all that stuff, because that was yeah. 2000, 2001, even then. But so we've got office scenes. So I, I got to find manual typewriter effects. I got to find phones with a ring, you know, the bell ringing. Uh, cars, you know, V8 cars. V I mean, so everything sounds different. It sounds, you know, because if you try to put in, you know, a Mazda sound underneath a Buick, people are going to notice. They might not say, hey, that's a Mazda. They're going to say... Their brain says feel. something's wrong. Something's yeah. wrong. And the same thing. It's like you cannot have computers going off or any of this stuff when it's manual typewriters in the offices. So it's looking at it and saying, okay, what's going on? And I think the film t takes place, I want to say, in 55 or 56 which is the year I was born. All right. And so I didn't have a lot of experience with sound as far as, you know, because I was a baby. Yeah. Uh, but, you know. Call I'm Norman just, Petty's ghost. You know? right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but so I was just trying to figure out what it, what it, you know, things sound like. And like I said, I love doing the film uh, from the sound standpoint. Todd was a, a blast to work with. I love Todd. But, you know, doing the, the, the effects work and everything was, was fun. How long were, How long were you in production on that? In post production. Well, post production. Yeah, uh, I think Excuse we me. had that film for about four months, four, huh. four and a half months. So Spent it, the last month, uh, give or take, in LA mixing. A lot of ADR. Or everything got pretty, pretty smooth. Yeah, everything went pretty smooth. A little bit of ADR, but not too much. Uh, it was shot extremely well. Nice. The sound was good. Who who do you remember? Who was I don't. Remember, who was the cinematographer on that? Do you... I don't. I was it Robbie Mueller. I don't know. It might have been Robbie Mueller. All right. Uh, because it was shot beautifully. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice. But film. but but Todd's storyboards everything. He's yeah. got notes on the art direction, the set design. He is so. I mean, I, apparently, you know, Robbie said at one point, it's like you, you just you don't need me. You know, you just I, I'm just pushing the button. This is all your design. Yeah. Um, but Robbie brought so much to it anyway. But Todd is very focused that way. What was different about working on a movie with Todd Haynes as opposed to Van Zandt? Um, Gus and I had had such a long history working together that pretty much he would just leave me alone. Yeah. Uh, and I could, you know, do my stuff because we would sit down and talk 
and then I'd go off and do that stuff. And there were times if he didn't like something, you know, we could change it, we could fix it. Uh, with Todd, Todd's a totally different personality. And so I had to learn a little bit on how to work with Todd, the kind of things that he... So I ended up watching a bunch of films that influenced Todd. Yeah. And listen and, and watch some of his older films again to get a feel for what Trying he was like. Trying to learn his style. Yeah, yeah. Um, he is the nicest, nicest guy. And uh, so... He was open to a lot of stuff, and I would say, well, what if we try this and this and this? He'd be like, give it a shot. Cool. That's right. And a lot of times he'd say, yeah, yeah, that's really great. Uh, and so, and he, he's much more vocal than uh, Gus. When we were doing, was it Goodwill Hunting? Might have been Goodwill Hunting. Yeah, it was. We were doing Goodwill Hunting, and we were doing a temp mix back in New York of the film, just a temporary for a quick screening. And the, the, we had a new post supervisor we'd never worked for, worked for the, the producers. And we're, ha we're having uh, lunch. And Gus and I are kind of, we're sitting across from each other, but everybody's, th oops, everybody sits at this long table. <laughs> of course I hit the microphone. <laughs> but everybody's, you know, at this long table uh, eating stuff. And, sh and she's talking, and, you know, he and I, as usual, are just sitting there not saying anything. Yeah. And she said, Can I ask you two a question? Because you've done a ton of films together. So, I, you know, we both kind of nodded, and she said, um, you guys are so tight as far as doing all this stuff. It's like it's like one brain up there. <clears throat> you guys are doing all this stuff, but you don't talk to each other. Why is that? And I remember looking over at Gus, and he looked at me, and we both kind of went, you know, but at that point in time, we shrugged our shoulders. Sorry, we're in radio. We know you're bringing Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> but... We had worked together for so long that I knew what he wanted and he knew what I was going for so that we didn't have to communicate. And so, you know, working with, uh, at that point anyway, but so working with Todd, it's like now I have to explain things. Now I have to, you know, find out stuff ahead of time because there's nothing worse than when I'm doing all the creation of the work, all the uh, designing and got my editors working and everything, the directors are never around because it's the most, you know, you're watching a sound editor work is like watching paint dry. I mean, it's really horrible. No, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Being uh, one sometimes but, can feel that way. Oh, God. <laughs> but when you are in the uh, mix stage, the studio is working, you know, you're paying ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 an hour when you start thinking about everything. That's a hell of a time to find out that you and the director are not on the same page. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> so I probably talked more with Todd for, I don't think we did a temp on that. I can't remember now. But, I, you know, I think I wanted to make sure that he didn't get surprised and I didn't get surprised uh, on the stage when we were working, that I had everything that I would need. And even if he wanted changes, they were things that we could do pretty quickly. So that was the real bit. He is much more verbal than, yeah. than Gus ever was. Gus seems quiet in Very his interviews. Quiet. In Very his quiet. interviews. There's yeah. a, that one with uh, with the Diane Keaton when they were working on Elephant, and he doesn't he doesn't oh. say too much. He never does. <clears throat> Um, no, let's talk gas at gas cafe for a second. So this is, this is worded, worded weird here. I'm okay. At, but, but it's, it's a, like, so you, you've obviously had made some efforts at low budget filmmaking before this, you know, you've been, right. you've always, you know, been thinking about that, but this was really like your first time kind of like, is an experiment a bad way to word that? Like saying that, that you're experimenting with like really low budget filmmaking. Like your goal is to. Yeah, I don't know if it was an experiment, but it was, I mean, it was a reality. But well, what were some of the goals money. that you set in place to do this? Like what were, like were there like, all right, we can't do this. I want to try and make this more difficult this way or uh, well, maybe not difficult, but try it differently. The whole thing was, you know, Bird Dog has a whole ton of locations, as does Kicking Bird, even because I got, because with Kicking Bird, I mean, they're all outdoors. But yeah. um, with uh, Gas Cafe, it's all one location, which actually ultimately it was two locations. The interior is one place and the exterior is another place. But I knew we could do all the exterior shots in a single night. Yeah. So how can we make an engaging story in one location, which is the bar? the cafe um and even though we have space in the bar you know so conversations happen in different places we're still in one location uh i want a very small cast and in uh gas cafe it's six people five main people and then the hitman shows up what's your crew like on set though because i mean this is pretty condensed well, you're in a bar right right well what we did the, the crew was pretty tight but what i did and it's i read an article years back before this uh 
written by Eric Edwards, the local cinematographer. He fil- he shot a film called Last Night at the Alamo Byron. down in Texas. Uh, and that was all took pl- takes place in a bar. And what he did is he went in a couple of days before they started shooting and hung all of his lights from the ceiling. And got all, and he lit the whole interior and got it all done so that they didn't have to light. You know, you walk into the bar, turn on, turn off their lights, turn on your lights, and you're ready to go. And I thought, brilliant. But even even beyond that, you also decorate. You had like decorations on the walls that were peculiar to certain things. Yeah. And you blacked out the windows at certain times and stuff to always get the well, night effect. Too. Well, yeah, I think we, we only blacked out the windows once because just about every other time we shot, we had one day when we were shot there, maybe two days. But for the most part, we shot at night. Um, so we, we I, and actually, I'm trying to remember if we did, I think we did black out the the windows anyway, even though shooting at night, so we wouldn't get any cars, lights, no cars going past. Um, but it was, you know, uh, the, the Randy, the cinematographer, you know, we hung everything from up above, and he had one uh, eye light that he would, on a stand, that we would move from place to place. But so the setups and everything were really quick, because we shot all the interiors and everything on that film in, I think it was eight days. <laughs> And so, and there were days when we'd have to, you know, do 15 pages of script, and even some that's of the, crazy though. 15 pages of script in a oh, day. Yeah. I mean, we're like oh, normally yeah. you're looking like seven or eight is is a haul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're doing like 15, but uh, since we weren't having to lights, we weren't having. I shot. That's the only time I ever shot two camera. Uh, I hated it. And you use a Canon X1 or something. You wrote about it too. Yeah, you talk yeah. about the, the yeah, type cheap of camera. Ass you camera. Use. Yeah. Uh, but it was because we were able to get a couple of those cameras for free. But you shot it all on videotape, then, right? That's a videotape yeah, camera. That's right? a videotape. Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, we shot everything really low light, which is what I wanted. Um, but it was really, uh, I wanted a really different look. I wanted a dark, foreboding look. Um, you know, we, we screwed up on the first night of shooting. Our light was too bright. I threw out the entire first night. Oh, you just overexposed it? And then, no, it looked flat. Oh, all right, all right. And so you could see everything, and I thought, that's not what I wanted. And so we had to re We We came in uh, the next day and turned off half the lights we had hung. And so we really had pools of light, and it's like, yes, this is what I want. Well, and so you know, so once again, I was you know irritating the hell out of the, the camera and lighting folks. <laughs> why didn't you like? Why not two cameras? Why why didn't you like shooting two cameras? This is a naive question. I don't know. No, no. Um, it's uh, I, I just I, I felt like it was a compromise. Uh, for, you know, I like having one camera. I never look through the camera. I never look at a monitor. I'm right there with the actors performing. But if I've got two cameras going and it's, you know, I, I find I have to be back farther from the um, action so I don't get into the other shot. Whereas wow. if I've got just one camera going, I'm right next to that camera. So I'm not, I'm not in the shot, but I'm close to the actors. But now I've got two cameras going, so I have to be careful where I stand to watch all this stuff. Because like I said, I don't trust monitors for performance or any of that stuff. My, you know, my feeling has always been if the actors are spitting on you while they're performing their lines, you're close enough. You're in a good place because right. I want to feel the performance. Literally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so having two cameras, it just felt like, you know, there's just so, you know, so much going on from what I'm directing when we're on set, I want to concentrate on the actors and the performances because I know all the technical stuff. We've already been through this. We've done our shot list. We've done the lighting. We've done you know everything else. I don't need to look through the camera because I know what the shot is. We've already... It's established. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I don't need to do that. It's a waste of time for me to do that. Let the professionals do that. What I need to do is work with the actors and make sure that they're there for performance-wise. Um and so I just felt like we just doubled all the work because we got two cameras and we got to adjust lighting now a little bit more because of the two and where are you going to be Where's and how are we going to get sound in there because we weren't using wireless. I still like a boom mic. Hey, you're uh, not crazy about labs, are you? No. Why not? Why don't why you like labs very much? Uh, the boom mic gives you the room. Yeah. It makes you, you know, you, you feel the presence of the whole thing. Lavalier mics give you the chest. <laughs> So you feel um, like it's almost like like say, like in the mic it's almost more compressed yeah. like all right, yeah I'm following you. yeah and the, the new labs are great you know and and it's not that feeling as much as it used to be um, but there's just something about and whenever I do use labs I always have to add a little reverb to the tracks so that it sounds like it's in the room I'm following whereas I don't you, have man. to do that with the boom it's there and some booms just seem natural to me. Um, but so it just seemed like it was an awful lot of work. I don't know how we could have shot the film any faster or at that speed that we did without doing two cameras. 
but it was not as enjoyable for me. I wish that, you know, we could have done just a single camera. Well, when looking back on your feature films, what are your main takeaways? Um, that if this doesn't work out, I can still get into plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, um, I, once again, it's, uh, I don't look back. Uh, I'm proud of the films. Uh, people like the films or don't. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, by what, it, like, like what the fuck would you not do next time? Nothing. Nothing? No, no. Because well, I mean, like, with like, Gas Cafe to Kicking Bird, like, you know, there's certain, like, we, like you just talk about the two cameras. So, like, on Kicking Bird, you're like, I don't want two cameras. Right, That was right. one. Like, is there any other thing like that? What were some of the, the things you're like, all right, this might be a good idea, especially when you start applying this stuff into the bo- the books, the filmmaker's guide, right. the first one in particular, where you're, right. like, giving strategies for how to do this, right. you know? What were some of the takeaways you had at that point? Um, yeah, th- that's a hard one to say, because... Uh, by the third film, I knew what I was getting into, and we tried new things and different things and shot so much stuff outdoors, so I didn't have to light, so I didn't have to worry about lighting, although even outdoors, we had some lights, yeah. just in case, you know, to make things look better. Um, but, I, I, you know, I think it was perfecting perfecting my style, perfecting my shooting. Um, you know, I, I still want to make a couple more features. Uh, how will I approach them differently now? I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I have a couple of scripts that I, I'm messing with a little bit, but I've also got some of the other things I got to finish up. That's um, such a different question, though. You know, because like the yeah. the, 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 <laughs> the everybody, especially people who've been in the game for a while, are talking about like the format. They're like, "Fuck if the format just changes one more time." You know, then, yeah, I, well, but I don't care. Well, they just they've just swapped like most of the things have just swapped to like HDR to UHD now, and half of the things that are out there don't have the capability for it. You know, so it's, it's right, a pain but, in the but the whole thing is, and I see all these young filmmakers and stuff. They're always saying, you know, Netflix put out a list of the cameras. Oh yeah, they, they have, have a camera sh- sh- spec record. Fuck yeah. you, Netflix. <laughs> and, well, they change it all the time. Like right, the Canon Mark III gets pulled on and off the thing and stuff like that. You know, you don't know what to do. Is, I'm not making my films for Netflix because the odds are they're not going to take them anyway. Yeah, yeah. Make you know, use the equipment and the stuff that you can get. Don't say we have to shoot with the red, we have to shoot with the arrow, we have to shoot with the Alexa. I know my camera friends are gonna go nuts in the air. This, you know, use the <laughs> gear that you can get hold of that's not going to break the bank. Concentrate more on the story and the writing. Don't do two two drafts or three drafts of your script and think it's good enough. No. I always tell people I won't show draft eight to my family and they love me. You I'm know, embarrassed I mean, of every draft. You gotta be yeah. like, I wanna wait till I get it on the on the screen. It'll look good then. You no, know? no, yeah. I mean, but you have to work with that. Yeah. The more you can work on the script and the story, then everything else is gonna fall into place. But you know, truly if Netflix or any of those other places sees your film and they want it badly they'll overlook whatever camera you shot it with. And if they won't, then they ain't about the art anyway. They're about the commerce. Well, if you now, like, in the in the digital world... So, like, say if you were going to shoot now, would you shoot, like, something digital, and then you would... Because, like, you know, the color science on these things has changed so much. Like, where, you know, you have, like, an 8-bit camera, but you can attach, like, these, like... Um, you know like what is it like the adobe or not adobe uh the atmos ninja or something right. like that that apparently yeah. enhances the color science would that be something that you would do now or you would you still be like like sean baker with tangerine mm-hmm. going shooting out on iphones which mm-hmm. is a different kind of sensor inside of it and it's unique what do you think about something like that which is another form of low budget filmmaking are they shooting on iPhones because we can now publicize the fact? Look, it's a whole movie shot on iPhones. Is it a gimmick? Full frame, and then, it looks like shit. I think. I mean, not what, not yeah. Tangerine, but like shooting on an but, iPhone. But but the whole thing is when we shot Kicking Bird and we shot, we used I can't remember what the camera we used. Now it was a, it was a Sony something or other. My DP was horrified, you know, but it was free. All right. <laughs> um, but I, but I said, you know, because he wanted to use this really really nice camera, Panasonic, I think it was at the time, and I said. The look of this film is bleak. The lives of these characters are bleak. If I could shoot this in black and white negative, 16 millimeter, I would. That's the look of the film. So why do I want an Alexa, a red, uh, you know, spend a ton of money when I'm going to take this thing into post and drain all that shit out? Why not grab the camera that we can get access to 
and it's funky enough. It's you know that I don't I, I didn't have to do a lot of color correction because it was you know it was a camera that had a lot of miles on it, yeah. and so it looked kind of we lit it so it looked good. But the colors were all muted. The colors were, you know, if you're writing, if you're doing scripts about people who don't have a future, poor people, you know, I mean, you know, working class, I mean, whatever it is, do you really want to show them against this colorful, beautiful ghetto, you know, or shit, run down neighborhood? I, I, or, it's like how Guys and Dolls looked with Brando and Sinatra. Well, it's weird. <laughs> yeah, but but it's also <laughs> um, the color purple. Yeah. I okay. I mean, it's like, you know, it, I love the book. I love the story. And you see his version of the movie and the colors are beautiful and the fashions are all so good. And it's like, really? Just do over the top. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, you know, this is this is a kid from the suburbs making a film about what he thinks like it's like to, you know, at this period of time. Something he's got no experience with. My films are meant to be gritty. My characters don't have a the full color spectrum in their lives. And so why am I going to kill myself or why am I, why do I have to use, you know, I got a DSLR now that I'm using for different stuff. All right. And a uh, buddy of mine gave it to me. Uh, it's a great camera. Man. And it didn't cost, well, it cost me $200 to get something fixed on it. But, well, not you know, bad. no, but I, I mean, it's just like, it's telling the story. I'm telling stories. I'm not going to get into discussions with, you know, and I'm not a cinematographer. Right, but I know the look of my films because I've created the story. I know the look of my actors. I know what I want. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the cinematographer's job to me, their collaboration with me, is to get that vision I see in my head. And if we don't share the same vision, maybe they're not the right person to shoot for me. Makes sense. And they could be like an amazing cinematographer, and a lot of them are. And I have so much respect for them, but if you're gonna you know, if you're gonna work with someone, you guys you you have to be on the same. You have to be on the same page, yeah. You have to like, understand the vision. <clears throat> well, and uh, Teresa Tamiyasu, who did all of my uh, set design and art direction, she and I were on the same page. Merry Christmas. She, you know, she's my customer. We're on the same page. You know, I mean, all these people had worked with me for so long. They knew what my films should look like, what I was striving for. And so, you know, it was great working with them because I could, <clears throat> you know, you talked about the L.A. Gun shirt. Yeah. You know, Mary Chris brings that in and says, this is what he's wearing. And it's like, perfect. You know, and this is the shirt that uh, the other character, uh, Bird, is wearing. Yes. And they don't change clothes throughout the movie. Why? Because they're a couple of poor kids and they don't have the latest fashions. They're different, you know. And, and that also worked from a low budget standpoint. Well, then you, most people did live in their LA guns shirts, so yeah. it is true. <laughs> it's very... That shirt was so beat up by the time. I mean, it was, it was in pretty rough shape when we started the film, but by the time we got to the end, it was in bad shape. <laughs> I just thought, oh, oh, please let that shirt hand, you know. And I think the Cody War was something I bought at Andy and Bax. Uh, you know, the old... The, uh, like, he had like a leather coat or something. A it heavier. wasn't leather. It was a wool. It was like a Swedish army. Almost just like a pea coat <laughs> feel to it in a sense. Okay, yeah. That, all yeah, right, I remember. Yeah, 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 I paid six bucks for it. Yeah. And, you know, and Mary Chris is like, that's his coat. It's like, <laughs> okay, but what if I get cold? <laughs> you can borrow it. Right. <laughs> well, shifting back to sound design for a bit. We're going everywhere. Uh, you, <laughs> you're keeping us on track, though. This I is what Reagan do. does, because yes. I'm, I'm loquacious, so I would be like, I have all these personal questions. I okay, need to hang know. On, hang on for a second. Alexa, what is loquacious? Oh. Okay, <laughs> let's go. Loquacious is when Poxy doesn't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> all right, so in your books, The Angry Filmmaker Survival Guide Part 1 and Part 2, you discuss your frustration with the cliches like, we'll just fix it in post. This offers up a lot of problems because fixing the sound in post requires the use of ADR, as well as more time and money. And for those who may not know, ADR stands for Automated Dialogue Replacement, which never has the same quality as a scene that's shot correctly the first time. How do you remedy a situation where a producer just wants to move on from a scene instead of getting it right on set? If you're talking about as a sound designer, uh, then we fix it the best we can, and we charge them as much as we possibly can get away with. <laughs> oh, so uh, they tell that them, way. <laughs> yeah, and tell them. Um, in, the second, in the second book, the sound book, 
uh, post supervisor, uh, and I quote his story, which I think is a great story. They were shooting a film, and the di- and the dialogue was just sounding like crap. And he finally called the location person because he knew the location recording and said, "You know, you're better than this. What's the problem?" And the guy said, "They're not giving me any setup time. Everybody's pushing. Everybody's, I'm not able to get my you know, mics in place and all that stuff. They're pushing. They're pushing. I'm doing the best I can. I'm really sorry, but this is your." <clears throat> and he said, "I'll take care of it." And he. <clears throat> went on set the next day. And this is the post-production supervisor. Isn't They're not supposed to be on set. He shows up on set, goes straight up to the producer, who happens to be talking with the director at the time, and the guy looks at him and says, yeah, and he says, you need to raise another $50,000. <laughs> and the producer's like, what? And he said, you need to raise me another $50,000 and you better get going. What the hell are you talking about? And he said, well, the dialogue sounds like crap because you're not giving him time, your location guy, time to get it right and to get it good. You need to raise another 50 grand because we're going to have to ADR this whole movie. Mm. And the producer looked at the director and went, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <coughs> and they had a quick conversation and the rest of the dialogue sounded great because the sound location design person got the time they needed. And so they didn't have to ADR anything. When you break it down to terms of money, producers and directors then listen to you. But I'm, you know, as a sound designer at the other end, I come in after it's all shot, and you know, and I've had conversations with some of these directors, and you know, I'm saying we have to ADR this, we have to, ADR, why do we have to do that? And it's like, listen, oh yeah, it doesn't sound, you can't fix that. It's like, no, I can't fix that, you know. And so you're gonna have to direct the actors, and it's six months later, and they're not in character, and they're not gonna, you know. And so um, when I direct, I wear headphones. I wear what I call Comtex, which are a wireless set of headphones, so that I can hear the dialogue going down onto the recorder. All right. Yeah. I hear it as it's happening. If I hear, My films are so dialogue-driven that if I hear something I don't like or, it's, or, or there's an airplane in the back, you know, whatever it is, I can say, we're going to do another take. And it, well, the, the cinematographer says, well, it's perfect. We don't need to, you know. And it's like, no, we do because I can't use this take. It was, Audio a, it was a great take, yeah. but I'm not going to try to. Uh, now, with a lot of that stuff, I can cut up dialogue from other takes and grab words from here and there and mesh it all together. Wow, that we has do, to be tedious as oh, hell. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, but... It's it, it'll still sound better usually than ADR. I look at ADR as a last resort. Do you ever have you ever had to like kind of push it through where you're like sitting in the theater watching this and you're like, I wonder if people could notice that. Like you're like waiting on them. Like when you like if you really are splicing I don't, something I, close. I, I don't go see the films in the theaters once I'm done. I rarely see a film once I'm done with it because I've seen it in the mixed studio. Like Thirty million times in right, thirty well, second sections. Right. <laughs> yeah. But but it's also I've seen it, you know, we've done a couple of screenings in the studio or in these great screening rooms. It's never going to sound that great again. Yeah, all right. You know, and I can remember I was dating this woman at one point, and she really wanted to go see the movie I'd just done. And I was like, really? No, I want you to take me. And I was <laughs> like, oh, God. You know, and so, of course, I took her. Uh, you know, and like I said, I was bored the whole time. I, mean, I think, you know, but I had to say, ah, this is great, you know. And she loved it being there with me. But I just thought, you know, this is two hours. I cannot get back. Yeah. Just <laughs> Do you know you can't it, like, get back. back. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I have to ask, what is the story behind the angry, the, the angry filmmaker logo? Who designed it? That was uh, designed by a fellow by the name of Jeff Pollard, uh, Pollard Design. Uh, he's an old, old friend of mine, uh, and he does a lot of logo design for, you know, some uh, big companies and stuff. He did Tiger Woods logo for Nike and all sorts of stuff. And we've been, shall I say, drinking buddies for years and years and years. Uh, and we were talking about logos one time, and I had this one particular logo that he just hated. And so I, I kind of said, you know, well, if you think you can do better, knowing that, you know. But uh, And he came up with this thing, which I think perfectly captured uh, my spirit and what I was going for. Now that now we're talking just to describe since we're on the air here, like it's it's the hand, but the but the, the middle finger is the film strip. That's, it, yeah, that's it's got sprocket yeah. holes running down it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and Angry Filmmaker is my company, and it's a seventy millimeter film strip. Of course, big, it, that's a big finger. wide yeah. finger. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know there are people who don't like um, the logo. And yeah, my feeling is if you don't like the logo, we probably shouldn't work together. You know, mm-hmm. you're probably not gonna like. But uh, most people love the logo and you know you guys have t-shirts and coffee mugs and everything now so i know you like the logo I am, but, <laughs> um, but you know on college campuses and stuff the, the merchandise always sells really well a lot of people do like the logo they just don't wear it in public you know reagan, you, yeah. you, reagan this, we, this isn't like on the on the docket but reagan had mentioned something about a road dog um 
merchandise yeah. and people being a pain in the ass letting you sell merch. Yeah, yeah, depending on... Uh, Does that film. factor into this? Like the logos? No, oh, no? Okay. oh, no, no, no. Some of the larger film festivals, uh, and specifically South by Southwest, All right. they're, you know, a lot of these places are selling their own merch, and so the last thing they want is you to be, you know, upstaging them. Mm. Um, I think in college campuses, theoretically, uh, they're not supposed to allow the sale of merch. Uh, but if you table this setup and saying, by the way, you know, if you're interested in any of that stuff, I mean, I would always do it really low key. Uh, but with a few of the places, they would say, you can't sell merchandise. And it's like, well, you, you want me to be here for nothing. You want me to talk to people. You want me to, you know, you want my expertise and you won't let me sell merchandise. Well, how am I going to make any money? Yeah. And, uh, you know, most of the film festivals were great. Uh, there were a couple uh, that uh, I'm, I'm persona non grata with now because... I chose to sell merchandise anyway and pissed off everybody. <laughs> but I made money. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, I'm trying to support myself. It's not like I'm this greedy, yeah. you know, person. It's I was doing all those tours and what was keeping me on the road, you know, promoting my work was the merchandise sales. And people would walk away from one of my screenings or one of my workshops or whatever. Because you don't make much money doing the workshops. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, you get three or 400 bucks for a couple of hours, you know, uh, on a workshop. Um, but you know, if you then sold two or three hundred dollars worth of merchandise, and the merchandise we use t-shirts, coffee mugs, uh, copies of my film, copies of the book, films, copies of the book, you know, that's how you make ends meet. Uh, sometimes some of the places would pay for your lodging, some wouldn't, you know, I mean, things like that. And yeah. so, I, you know, I'd be out on the road for a long, long time, and merchandise sales was what usually allowed everything to break even. Well, so let's talk Road Dog for a minute then, because this is this book's different from the Angie Filmmaker Guides. You know, you you discuss in Road Dog traveling the country with your dog Moses to screen your films. Were there any stories that didn't make it, you know, to print that you put in the book? But what stories that you put in the book are the most essential to you? Because I know we talked previously about um, some of them that were more significant than others. At, at least they had more of a personal impact in you. I know they all did. And what were some of the critical decisions that you had to make during your time on the road? You know, it's funny because a lot of it comes down to the very first um, uh, tour because I was broke. Yeah. I was just dead ass broke and things were not going well. And that's why I decided to go out on the road. And uh, I borrowed a pickup truck and a canopy and had everything thrown in there. And I had enough money to get to my first gig, which was in Colorado. Where are you leaving from here? Portland, yeah. All right. And so and it's like I stopped in Idaho uh, to stay at a friend's place because free lodging, free food, you know. But yeah, yeah. I had enough money to get there. And, and I had booked out two months. But if I didn't make money at the very first gig, I was screwed. I didn't have enough money to get to the second gig. That's how broke I was. So I roll into Colorado. I'm staying at, the, you know, at this place. And this is kind of a funny story. Uh, I have two gigs in Colorado. One is at the university. And what I don't know at this time, because I'm an idiot, is, <laughs> you know, they said they offered me like 75 bucks or whatever it was. I was like, cool. Yeah. Well, they didn't tell me I have to invoice them, and then it'll be 30 days before I see that 75 bucks. That's a lot of work for 75 bucks. It was a lot of work you for need, $75. Like, tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so I go to the school, and I do it, and that's when I'm told, oh, no, you have to invoice this. You know, I think I sold two DVDs. So I was like, so I had $20 in my pocket. I was like, that's not enough. But I had a second gig, and I'd gotten been contacted by this guy um, who wanted me to come and talk to their company. about. And it was, they do film work, you know, and they wanted me to talk about sound and all this stuff. And I said, yeah, and he gave me all the details. And I worked on it, and I think they were going to pay me like eight or 900 bucks for a couple of hours. And plus, he'd put me up, cover meals and everything else. Cool. And uh, people kept asking, so, you know, what's the second gig before I hit the road? And I thought, well, some company. Well, what company? And I thought, I don't know. So I'm calling the guy back. And I said, by the way, what, what company is this that you work for? And what are you, you know, some satellite company, you know, whatever it is? And he said, well, you can uh, turn down the job if you want, because a lot of people do, and a lot of people are uncomfortable with this. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, what is this? <laughs> and he said, but we do porn. Yeah. And I said, and he said, now we don't make it here. We're a satellite company, but we feed all the hotels and stuff. So, you know, we do do some trailers and you da 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 based on the shows. But, you know, this is, yeah, it's a porn outfit. And I said, cool. <laughs> I'm there. I yeah. got no problem. 
So, and I knew that, okay, I've got this 800 bucks. And, and then I'm thinking, oh shoot, do I have to invoice on this too? But he said, no, he had, he had to check for me and pay me as soon as we were done. Um, that's the great thing about porn. You know, they, they take care of you. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, uh, so there's a whole Industry group of, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a whole group of, uh, people that I'm going to talk to and they're all graduates from the, the film school, the film program that I'd been at the university earlier. Yeah. Now, if you live in Boulder, apparently, if you go to school in Boulder, when you get out, there's two places you can go to work. This is back then. You can go to work for, uh, what's his name? The guy who did all the ski movies. Um, the ski movies? Yeah, yeah. He'd do these big um, ski movies. Miller something. I can't remember. I hadn't seen those George Miller movies. Mad Max coming down the no, slopes. Wrong, no, I'm just wrong, kidding. Yeah, wrong, <laughs> wrong. No, I don't but know. But every, I mean, you know, it's a fancy skiing and on and on and on. Yeah. Um, or you work in this porn place and all these people want to stay in Colorado and so, and the porn place played, paid so much better than the ski movies. Um, so these were all things. And so we have this amazing workshop on audio, but it's not for audio for porn. It's, you know, their own individual, the company has put this on for their employees for other things because they want to keep all these, some talented, talented people and doing, and they were doing animation and, you know, I mean, all this other personal experimental films. It was really, really cool. The downside to all this is we're in this big conference room. And I'm at one end of the room at the table, and everybody's around this long table, and they're all taking notes like crazy as I'm talking. But at the far end is a big monitor, and it is showing thus the feed, which means I'm trying to talk about sound and sound design when all this porn is going on, and I'm looking directly at it. I mean, I'm trying to look at everybody else. But this is like, why the Bette Davis film was distracting you it, earlier. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, yeah. But, but it's, it's it, wild be, with her and Joan Crawford. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, no, because it's it's motion. Yeah. You know, anytime you see something on a screen or something. But it's screen, inaudible, look, right? It's inaudible. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Sound, right. is off. Sound, <laughs> sound is off. But it's like, it's all these, you know, and you want to see, and, you know, I'm talking about microphone placement and everything else, and then all of a sudden, you know, you kind of you kind of glance up and go, how the hell did they do that? Yeah. You know, but it's like, no, no, no. Focus on your teaching. Your teaching. Yeah. You know, and I said, they could have faced me the other way, but then all of the employees would be looking. <laughs> right. So either way, you know, but they were all used to it. They were all numb to it. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, I didn't care. You know, that's that's porn is for consenting adults. I mean, whatever. But you know, but the great part about it was not only when we're done, they had this incredible catered meal. Yeah. And I think I spoke, it was a three-hour thing. They hand me, you know, eight, the $800, eight, $900, whatever it was, right then. It was a check. Um, and the students, I mean, the students, the people who worked there, they must have bought four, or $500 worth of my merchandise, cash. Nice. All of a sudden, the tour can go on because I have enough money to get to the next. And what I did is I took the check and I took probably half of the money that I made, you know, in the merchandise sales, put an envelope and sent it home, mailed it home. So that every time I was doing my next gig, I was always nearly broke, which meant that I have to do a really good workshop. I have to do a really good, you know, whatever it is and do the best job I can to sell merch because that's the money I'm going to need to You're get into the next putting a fire under gig. your own ass is what it sounds like. I did. Yeah. I did. And it was, and it was, and, you know, now when, when the last time I went on tour was 2017, but, you know, when I would go out now, well, we've got our cards. We've got, you know, we access to all this other stuff, so it's no big deal. But back then, it wasn't that easy, but it made me a better um, promoter, better act, better, you know, because I couldn't walk through any of my workshops. I can't be, you know, just kind of, uh, I got money, I don't care, I'm tired, I don't want to do this. It's like, no, I got to bring a thousand percent every time I am in front of a group of people. Yeah. And when I first started off, it was not easy for me to get out there and talk, especially when I, I mean, I've been in front of whole schools. You know, having a couple hundred people out there, and you got to be witty, and you got to. You well, know, you're teaching a unique that. craft too. Do you get a lot of naysayers? Like you were, we were talking about the the camera stuff earlier, and you talked about your DPs like being like, "Oh, you're making me use this." Do you, film students? Do you have to battle it out with them that way, or? 
Um, no, I mean, every now and again, I'll get a noisy a film student or whatever. Cause and most of the time they think that they know so much more than you do Yeah, because they've been watching DVDs and not doing it, but you know, they know all this stuff. Well, you um, obviously know quite a bit. You've been around the block with this stuff. You but, know? but I always tell people, I know a little bit, you know, but what I know is more than what you know. <laughs> I would imagine. You know, but yeah. I mean, and, and that's my, because they're, they're students, yeah, you can watch all the DVDs you want, but until you're in the trenches, that's, just, that's it's all academic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, plus they gloss up the stuff that's on the DVDs. They make it look better than it really, really is. Um, you know, but so, you know, you always get some people who know it all. And I think it's not just in, endemic to film. I think it's, you know, whatever you're teaching, there's always going to be somebody who thinks that they know more than you or they want everybody just think that they know so much and it's like if you know so much what the fuck are you doing here that's just easy to coach from the sidelines yeah yeah, yeah. um but so you know uh by light, lighting a fire under myself every time i stepped in front of a group of people uh, i think it it made the workshops better it made me work harder it made me I, and i think the ultimate goal was the audiences, the students, whoever it was, got more out of it. They got a better experience out of it, which is what it's all about. What about taking Moses on the road? What was that like? You have your dog with Hilda the whole time. You oh, know? Yeah. And then I know that the story gets sad towards the end of this experience. But <laughs> We won't talk about that part. All right. No, um, you know, one, Moses was a 120-pound chocolate Labrador retriever. If I'm going to hit the road, where's he going to stay? He's a little guy then. Yeah, where is he going to stay? You know, I mean, I can leave him with my daughter who's eight or 10 or whatever she was with, you know, with my ex. Yeah, that's not going to happen. And he was my companion. I mean, he went with me everywhere. He was, he was huge and incredibly mellow. Right. And he loved being in the van. He wanted to be with me wherever it was. And so, you know, I could take him into, <laughs> I would take him into college campuses, you know, into the lecture halls, the theaters, wherever it was. And he would just curl up and go to sleep. Uh, and there were times when, okay, we're going to take a break here, you know, so let's go get coffee, you know, whatever it is. And the lights would come up or whatever it is. And that's, he always knew. It's like, okay, he would stand up and start stretching. And all of a sudden you get all these people saying, there's a dog in here. <laughs> um, they, had, they hadn't realized that he'd been laying there next to me, you know. And I would feel sorry for the dog because he'd heard the jokes over and over, the same joke, you know. But... He was just, he was, he was a great traveling companion. And Mickey, who was my second dog, was also fantastic. And they were so mellow and so well behaved that I could take him into places. By the same jokes, you mean like they just got tired of human condescension? Like, no, they dude. got tired of me talking. Oh, they got like, tired of you like, on repeat then. All yeah. right, all right. When did I you work, me, did you work your pitches with them in the car? <laughs> <laughs> Probably should have. <laughs> uh, when I took my daughter out on one of the tours, we were out for like three weeks. I think on the fourth or fifth uh, day. She talked to me that night, you know, we were uh, having dinner. And uh, she said, Dad, you know you tell the same jokes every time. And I said, and I tell them in the same places. <laughs> <laughs> and she stopped, she said, and she was 15. She said, yeah, you do. And I said, these people, it's all new to everybody we're talking to. Yeah. You, you've been with me for the last four days. I said, it's only going to get worse for you. I said, these jokes are time tested. I've, I've run, you know, I know what I've tried all this material out. Da, 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 da. They work. And I said, if you want, I'll try to come up with some new stuff. And she thought about it. She said, no, keep doing what you're doing. As long as the audience is happy, I can put up with it. But can you please ask them not to always ask me so are you going to be a filmmaker when you grow up uh, <laughs> they would always ask me the same questions which drove her crazy with um uh what was i going to ask my brain just went blank oh um uh so you asked something I had a good question go ahead, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead go ahead all right well you've recently written some short story compilation books and done some sound design work on other films can you tell us a little bit about any future projects you've been working on um, one of the films that I've just finished up for a friend of mine is called Live Out Loud, uh, and it's about three homeless people here in Portland uh, who, uh, there was a, a, a group that started this art program, and they were bringing people in who were homeless uh, or living in shelters, and they were teaching them how to make film and how to make art. Uh, and so, <clears throat> and this film was all shot, I think, in 2013. It's taken her this long to get the money to finish it. Um, but it's a really nice feature-length documentary that follows three people through this. All three of them, to our knowledge, are no longer on the streets. They are constructive. They are. Uh, um, so I've just finished that up. I'm trying to cut the trailer right now. A friend of mine did a short personal film uh, on suicide 
which is really cool and really intense. Um, and I'm trying to finish that up right now from the sound design standpoint. Um, and that's been a challenge, but it's, 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 it's a very, it's kind of a dark film, but, a, but a, a good film. It, it does not exploit, uh, you know, the whole suicide thing. It's, it's an integral part, part of the story. Uh, I, I've, like I said, I've got the two books of short stories out. I'm hoping to bring a third one out in the late spring. Uh, so I'm still writing every day. I've got my, another film that I, my documentary on K Boyle that I'm working on and the goal is to have it done finally by the end of this year, but that's been a 30 plus year project. So you've been working on that one for quite a while, haven't you? 30 plus years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's totally unfundable because nobody knows who she is and hopefully uh, this film will remedy that. Um, but I, I have a ton of my own money into this and time and I've had some amazing people to work with. I mean, she passed away in 1992. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is the same year my daughter was born. Uh, but, um, yeah, so I'm trying to get that finished up. Uh, there's some, I, I did, I just finished a film a little while ago out of DC on uh, Irma Thomas, uh, who's a painter. Wonderful, wonderful film. Uh, I think it's an Irma. Um, Alma, Alma Thomas, I'm sorry, Alma Thomas, uh, wonderful, wonderful painter. Um, so these are the films that I like doing and, you know, keep me going. Uh, it's something that's interesting and, you know, uh, I, I, the filmmakers don't have the money that the big ones do, but at this yeah. point in time, I want to work on something that is creatively fulfilling and I only work with people that I like. No. And so I say no to a lot of people because I'm a cranky, cranky old filmmaker. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, there's some people who are just like, you know, they're kind of intense or this or that. Or, or and if, it's, if, if it's subject matter that doesn't strike me, then uh, I'm at this point where it's like, you know, good luck and I hope you do really well with this stuff. But it's not, we are not a good fit. You know, that's that's the question I wanted to ask. It's, it's that... Uh... You've done interviews with a lot of people, and like, in, like I read one about a like a guys that were in the horror genre had interviewed you, and a lot of these people take your your you know your process and and your interest in low budget filmmaking, but they seem to at times misinterpret it as like a money saver rather than a style or an approach. How how are you able to bring people like who are making exploitative films or low budget films that aren't exactly like visionary or storytelling? And it, what what is the advice that you give for them? You know, I, I, and that's a tough question because my advice to everybody is always make what you believe in. Yeah. You know, you have to you have to be working on something that's. A, I, I think they should all be passion projects. Not everybody feels the same way. Um, <clears throat> some of the stuff that I do recommend, you know, does save money, um, and maybe it's not as much for um, you know artistic reasons or whatever or stylistic reasons. Um, I, I think I put the information out there and you just kind of have to take it where you want to go with it. You know, you mentioned horror films and I've done a couple of horror films, not my genre. I don't watch them. Mm -hmm. I respect them. And I think that horror films should have their own, uh, category, audio sound category at the Oscars. Cause some of the best sound work I ever see are in horror films. Explain <clears throat> for the, for the, yeah. I, I'm ignorant of this. Well, <clears throat> Sound so much of horror. It's like uh, the things that terrify us are not when you see the monster. It's the build up to getting to the monster. Uh, so this is kind of like what we were talking about. I can't let too much up, but talking about a little bit earlier with uh, some of the stuff that you mixed into certain movies that were kind of right. accenting this, giving you the the feeling of what's going on. Right. And so the scary moment in, say, a horror film is the main character walking down the hallway when we know that there's a monster at the end. The scariest part is not seeing the monster. Yeah. The scariest part is that walk. And so the sound design on those things, you'll find that usually there's no music. You'll accentuate the footsteps. Maybe there's a squeak. Maybe there's this. Maybe there's, you know, but you're taking the, the common sounds that are around us and you're kind of amplifying them so that, and really the, the fright at the end of the shot is the release. The whole tick, 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 boom. Yeah. Kind of thing, and yeah. so, you know, when that happens, the whole audience, they might shriek or whatever, just, but they deflate. Yeah. The suspense but, is gone. Right. But walking 
down that dark hallway is where all the suspense is. And so much of that has to do with the audio and what's chosen to and how long is that hallway and what are these people thinking and what are the little incidental to me i mean on a lot of horror films the sound is is art and like i said i've done a couple of them and said not my genre i don't my daughter is a huge horror film fanatic and i've got a couple of friends who are too mm. uh and i i appreciate them and i recognize the artistry behind them uh, I don't enjoy watching them. I'm not that much into them. But the artistry behind so many of them is pretty amazing. Well, before we go, teaching. You get into teaching. What is, what is Where does that come in when it's, it's with cinema or making movies and filmmaking in general? Um, <clears throat> I do teach on occasion. I start teaching again tomorrow just for two weeks. Uh, you know, somebody has to teach some of these new filmmakers about the stuff that they don't want to learn, i.e. sound. Yeah. Uh, you know, tomorrow I'm teaching, starting tomorrow I'm teaching a, a different class. It's a film watching class, uh, different reasons. Um, but, you know, part of it is I think I started, uh, the, the teaching and the workshops became part of the whole tour and getting the name out and then they became something uh, larger, I guess. Um you know, I, I am, honestly, I hate saying this, I'm winding down on the teaching. I'm not doing it as much as I used to, and I don't wish to. Part of it is, at this point in time, because everybody who's listening to this can't see me. All right. You know, I'm 65. Uh, I've had a few health issues. And built like uh, Hasselhoff for all of you. That's uh, right. Yeah, <laughs> very buff. Very yeah. buff. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> the road in front of me is a lot shorter than the road behind me. All right. And now is the time for me to concentrate on my own work and to do as much of my own stuff as possible while still doing sound design for projects that I'm interested in. Um, teaching and some of these other things because, oddly enough, I care. <laughs> you know, I want the students to learn. I want to, I invest a lot of myself into it. Yeah. I don't want to, I'm getting selfish. I want, I'm, I'm trying to take that time back so that I can create more. And I have so many stories in my head, so many projects that I want to do. On, on, so the teaching is, you know, uh, with the touring, I did the touring for seven, eight years and then took a couple of years off so I could have surgery and then did another tour in, seven, in 2017. But the tours are done. Yeah, you know, because when I go out on the road, that's two months and it's all consuming. I'm living mm -hmm. in the van with a dog, you know, and going from place to place to place. I mean, I put twelve thousand miles. Having, having toured in punk bands for years, the way you yeah. describe it is like they're they're like equivocal, other than yours, like screening movies rather than like setting up in a like the shittiest bar of every town right. for a punk gig. So you're probably in a little better position than that, but still, it's got the same workload and the work effort. Yeah, I'm following. And if you're in a punk band, you can share the driving. Yeah. The dog does not have opposable thumbs. That is a really good point. That so is a good point. I did all the, you know, so I'd have to, I mean, I'm doing setup, tear down, doing the performance, and driving the van. All right. You know, it's, it's this like, is nothing. This is like touring as a one man act. All right. Take it back. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, Willie Nelson has a bus. Yeah, that's true. That's right? true. I've, I've, I've got a Ford Freestar. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it's I, I love the touring. I've I met so many amazing people. I you know, seeing the country so many times and doing all this other shit. It's all very, very cool. Yeah. But once again, I'm trying to wind all that stuff down and take time for me. I still have so many stories uh, in me that I need to get out. Uh, I'm also, dare I say it, I'm a grandfather. Uh, and so it'd be nice to, you know, spend a little bit of time with my granddaughter. I mean, you, you've talked about your granddaughter before off the air with us, and you, you definitely enjoy your time with her, too. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, my daughter put up with a lot. I mean, she went out on the road with me. She, uh, We watched the film, and I don't know if you guys have watched the film, uh, The Other F Word, which is about punk rock fathers. Oh, actually, no, I've seen clips with, like, let's say, like, Lars it's Fredrickson great. and stuff in it. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's great because... This is Reagan's life. Yeah, just it kidding. is. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it, it, and, you know, my daughter and I watched it together, yeah. And she was kind of, because sometimes she'd be a little upset that I'd be off on the road and doing all this other stuff. But once we watched it, she said, you know, afterwards we had this great discussion. She said, I get it, Dad. You know, I understand. And then she went on the road with me once, too. And it's a hard life, no matter, you know, the, the touring and stuff. And, you know, like I say, I enjoyed it for what it was, when it was, and all of that stuff. But, you know, I, I'm looking at New Horizons now. You know, and 
I said, when you get older, my night vision isn't what it once was. It's, you know, so I, I'm not ready to be put up to the pasture yet. I still got a lot of work to do. All right. Well, we'll keep you keep you busy till then. All right, wall crawlers. We are running. What's up? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what are you looking at me for, Reagan? Nothing. I was just I gonna. Was I was trying to pitch. All right, all right, wall crawlers. We are running short on time. That's what they make me say. I'm Poxy Leonard <laughs> here with Miss Reagan, and we've been speaking with the angry filmmaker himself, Mr. Kelly Baker, about his work on extreme low budget filmmaking, sound design, and of course, his angry filmmaker book series, amongst the many other things we've discussed here today. Kelly, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and uh, we very much appreciate your time coming on the show here. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks for coming up with some cool questions. All right, we try. Yeah, of course. We try. You're listening to The Ghost of Hollywood. I'm Ms. Reagan, and we'll be back shortly to say goodbye. Also, please check out the Anger Filmmaker books, as well as Kelly's feature-length films, Bird Dog, The Gas Cafe, and Kicking Bird. They are available for purchase on Kelly's website at the Angry Film... Not the Angry Filmmaker, but angryfilmmaker.com. Can't get enough of The Ghost of Hollywood? Check out our entire first season, now streaming wherever you choose to listen to your podcast. And don't forget to like and subscribe. While you're at it, check out our website at theghostofhollywood.com so that we can keep you up to date on all the latest with The Ghost of Hollywood. You're listening to KBOO 90.7 FM Portland, streaming live at kboo.fm. KBOO Community Radio relies on support from listeners like you so that we are able to continue providing the community with a voice powered by the airwaves. To donate, please visit our website at kboo.fm. A red donate button is located at the top of the page. Simply click here and list the amount that you would like to donate to KBOO. While you're at it, leave us a message telling us why you support KBOO. As always, thank you for your continued support of KBOO Community Radio. All right, everyone, the time has come for us to say goodbye as we wrap up our 15th episode here at the Ghost of Hollywood. I'm Ms. Reagan here with Foxy Leonard. And we'd like to thank tonight's guest, Kelly Baker, for joining us on the show. Remember that you can check out more information about Kelly and his work at angryfilmmaker.com. And you know what, Reagan? What? You totally botched that at the end oh, of the interview. give me a break. At least I wasn't stumbling over the prompter trying to read the year in the introduction, Mr. 1980 Hey, look. 1980-90 was a good year. Whatever. Yeah, you know, same year you released your first screen prey. Uh, yeah, Ray. Screw you, Poxy. <laughs> hey, uh-oh. You, you see that? Get a little carried away with the profanity tonight. Uh, they'll get over it. I'm a star, goddammit, a star! You're delusional you. is what you are. We'd like to thank our crew for all of their hard work on this episode. Also, thanks again to Kelly Baker for joining us on the show tonight. And I think that about wraps it up. For more information on The Ghost of Hollywood, please visit theghostofhollywood.com. You can also find us on KBOO 90.7 FM Portland between 3 and 5.30 a.m. every other Friday. But unless you have insomnia or work at an odd hour, it may be best to catch the full episodes on the website where they're available for download. The Ghost of Hollywood is also streaming wherever you get your podcasts. So make sure to like and subscribe to listen in on all of the latest episodes. All right, wall crawlers, that's a wrap. I'm out of here. Gotta go. I'll see you next time, baby. Until next time, everybody. Good morning. And good night. Poxy, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Get back here. <laughs> <gasps> All right, guys. It's now my show. <laughs> no one's going to help you. <laughs> you have been listening to The Ghost of Hollywood. The Ghost of Hollywood was created and is directed by Zach Flannery. It is authored by Chris Klon. Background music composition by Jesse Garcia in Pineapple Nightmare. Mixing and mastering in final production by Zach Flannery and Grady Sizemore at Microphonic Meltdown. Performances by Reagan Flannery and Zach Flannery. Production management by Beth Flannery. For more information, contact or to listen to the ghost of hollywood please visit the ghost of hollywood.com the ghost of hollywood was produced by the electric garden company in portland oregon for more information on the electric garden company please visit electricgardencompany.com